Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Strange Road. I'm your host, Mikey, and of course, always riding shotgun, the bro host, Bub. Bub, how you doing tonight? What's up? Feeling good? I'm locked and loaded. We got a good one tonight. And tonight, also, guys, we have Stoner and our boy Sam Thompson in Master Control holding it down, making everything look and sound awesome like usual. What's happening, Necro? We see you. There we go. There's that Master Control shot, everybody. Look at those guys in there. Working hard. Uh, Justin Lamb, Sess in the City. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the show. Uh, As always, you guys can find us on Instagram. TikTok and Twitter at The Strange Road. The Facebook group is rocking. If you guys aren't a part of that, jump in there. Uh, and of course, always in YouTube, these live streams and uh, and all of the premieres are ad-free. Great way to support the show is with those super stickers and super chats. Uh, always share, like, subscribe, the whole nine yards. And you guys can listen to us on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Please, a lot of you guys are out there reviewing, so you've been hearing our calls. We appreciate Uh, it. Yes. We we need that. We appreciate you guys so much. It helps. And also the merch portal, the strange road merch.com is live and launched. Some of you guys out there, we got our boy TJ, we got Bert Moran. What's happening, Bert? And I see you in the chat. Um, we oh, have yes. uh, our friend Chasing Mountain Builders and Sess in the City. What's up? All you guys for supporting us, um, you know, throwing down some loot to support the brand and, and the show and, and flashing those colors. So you guys are the best. Not only that, Thank making you. it look good. Making that look good. Making it look good. Making it look Jeez real good. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to start working on my game. Jeez. Em. So we appreciate you guys. And, hey, we're going to jump right into it. We Our guest... Tonight is a stand-up comic, seeker, paranormal investigator, and host of Me and Paranormal You podcast. Please welcome comedy's crown prince of weird, <laughs> Ryan Singer, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, man. Welcome, welcome. This place yeah. is rad. I mean, Thank you we have very to much. say from the get, Thank you. the studio, I could live in this studio. That's what I know I like a place where I walk in. I'm like, I would crash here for over a year. And you're welcome to. Yeah. Because <laughs> we've all slept Careful, here. I'm on the float right now, yeah. Yeah. which means I might take you up on that. Well, hey, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. I came oh, in one man. morning uh, for the uh, start of the day, and one of our guests was a night shift worker that – to make the episode work, came in and, like, crashed on the beanbag chair in the corner for a while. So I came in very quiet. They slept up until, like, 1 or 2 in the afternoon and then, like, woke them up to, like, make the episode happen. So, like, when you say that, believe me, I've I've run it through my mind before of, like, <laughs> I've I know where you're at. Yeah. I've slept here. I could hang out here for a while. Yeah. Oh, man. That's awesome. Hey, what's happening, Born Not to Run? You guys are great. Uh, we got a great show tonight. And, Ryan, I want to give you the floor, man. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, where we can find you. Um, you know, let us know your tours are, your tours coming up. you got some gigs yeah. to promote. Whatever you, whatever you okay. the floor is well, yours. Well, first of all, the full moon. I drove in from Dayton. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure if we're giving away the secret base locations. No, no, no. no. But, um, the full moon tonight, the full beaver moon, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. was guiding me the whole way here. And I was like, this is going to be a good show. Special. I didn't because I love, I'm a moon guy. Like, I'm full Us on too. moon worshiper. I mean, I just can't get enough of the moon. But, um, so I'm a weirdo. Always have been. Uh, I've always, I guess I've always been called weird. Like, it's one of these things you, re- I'm 47 years old now. So I realize. Oh, ever since I was a kid, I've always been like, oh, Singer, you're so weird. And I was just always <laughs> like, okay, whatever, right? And uh, like, because I like to have fun and talk about weird, uh, cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so I've always been kind of a weirdo. And then I got into, and I always knew I wanted to do stand-up comedy, got into that. And then I had some really crazy paranormal experiences, some high-level, you know, SPEs, like spontaneous paranormal experiences, something okay. I wasn't seeking that just happened. And one specifically happened, and it sent me on a quest, a journey to look for information and answers to make myself feel less crazy, things like that, right? Like so many people do. Looking for comfort and community, which Mm -hmm. is such a huge part of high strangeness. Mm -hmm. And thank God for podcasts and for the digital age in that way, being able to connect so many of us in that way. And so I started a podcast almost 10 years ago now. 
me and wow. Paranormal You. Yeah. Wow. So I've had That's awesome. over 700 episodes. So I've interviewed, you know, over 400 people probably or Jeez. over 400 interviews. And I also do solo um, where I just do, you know, talk about my research or what I'm reading or what I'm into or what's going on, you know, in the world of the paranormal that I'm into. And so it's taken me across everything as the spectrum. For me, paranormal is anything outside the normal. It's not just ghosts or aliens. Right. I remember, I think it was 2017, I was at Alien Con. I was like the official podcast of Alien Con. Nice. Really, right? Nice. And, um, oh, I got to meet and interview Katie Sackoff from Battlestar Galactica. No way. And talk, that's the most nervous I've ever been during <laughs> an interview of, in my entire life. Because uh, I'd been binging, like, what is there, like 200 episodes oh, of this yeah. show or something? Yeah. And so I just wanted to tell her and be like, I've seen like 200 hours of you. You know, but I was like, keep it together, man. But um, <laughs> anyway, like so many people at that, I was surprised. How many people at AlienCon People who would go to something called Alien Con mm-hmm. would ask me, what are you doing here with me and Paranormal You? This is Alien Con. Paranormal is ghost stuff. Mm-mm. Right? And I was like, oh, you think it's only ghost stuff? Because then it's funny because then there's other people who think paranormal is alien stuff. You know, but for me, it's it's not that specific or specialized. This is kind yeah, of why the I strange agree. road, though, is the strange road, right? It's It's not just... UFOs or ancient this or it's in that vein of going. We've tried to keep we it pretty broad because our our I interests on are all over the place. Yeah, I'm looking at know. the books and I can tell. <laughs> and I mean, I miss my books, man. <laughs> like all my stuff's in a storage unit in Los Angeles right now because I moved out of my place early summer. Yeah, but I miss my books. Yeah, and I was talking to a good friend of mine. I was like, I need to go Kindle, right? I need to because when I move out, Stoner's I big Kindle. what Audible. I did was. I figured out the best way to move books because I've moved so much. Mm-hmm. Large duffel bags yeah. for moving are great yeah. uh, as opposed to boxes and things like that. But um, And I've just got so many other books. I, I've got like three different uh, Ivan Sanderson books right now that I'm just, you know— deep into who's like one of the you know the godfather of cryptozoology and all that kind of stuff but i'm not familiar um, yeah he's like on my mount rushmore of of paranormal stuff right you have you have like john keel you'll have i was about to say where does that are are they kind of like contemporaries or are they uh well sanderson's been dead for a long time but yes they they did um no, I mean, at the time, were they, Keel and, and Sanderson, were they... Alive at the same time? Yeah, were they... Right they were in communication with one another. Okay. Um, I don't think they were BFFs. Oh, okay. They weren't like bro-hosts. They're like battling but, uh, but they <laughs> definitely... <laughs> guys get like that. We were down at Mothman Fest, and uh, the Paranormal Road Trippers, <laughs> those guys said that all the Mothman guys just battle with each other, all those researchers. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Like back, in, yeah. Well, it's interesting because Sanderson was, he was parallel, I guess, mm. to to Keel. I, I would say, meaning uh, they weren't in direct competition with one another. I wouldn't say. Okay. But it's interesting because I mean Sanderson was a botanist and like a scientist guy, sure, who got into all that stuff. But um, you know, but then there's you know Bernard Huvelmans who was also like you know, the co-godfather of cryptozoology, right? Many people would say, um, you know, and very specifically, we're talking about Western world appreciation and investigation, right? And and I think Sanderson does a good job of recognizing that, being like, hey, listen, these are all the Western world. We didn't start hearing about the abominable snowman or blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah. And these dates in the Western world. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was like, yeah, this is just part of our folklore, our mythology, our history, our stories. Right. Um, because they're not so hung up on, you know, the scientific method and all this other, the materialistic right. world. Um, but anyway, so like that podcast, I never knew I would get this deep into all of this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I, it's one of those things where, you know, some rabbit holes are very, very seductive. Right, and they just sure. keep bringing you further in, and other rabbit holes just have somebody at the bottom trying to sell you a bunker, and that's most of them, I think, nowadays. Trying th- to get you in a cul-de-sac that leads you to nowhere. 
Yeah, or you know, they're they're selling you something. They're mm-hmm. using fear. They're right. using anger. They're yeah. using uh, paranoia. I, I feel like we're kind of in a paranoia pandemic because conspiracy theories have like infiltrated every aspect of life. Mm-hmm. Nothing is real anymore, and you, you know what? Maybe nothing is real, right? <laughs> That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. But I feel like we have a you know a pandemic of paranoia right now, and you know, and it's and it's hurtful, and you can see its negative effects. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have hope. And I know a lot of people think the world's burning down, and you know maybe it is, and maybe it's always always has been. Mm-hmm. But every story, whether it's religious or whether it's ufology or whether it's even ghosts, you know, you get together with some friends and you go on paranormal investigations, and which I love doing. All of these stories, at the end of the day, they're hopeful because I think what we are doing is we are seeing in these in phenomena or in the esoteric, in the high strange, we are seeing a reflection of what we hope for human beings to be. When we talk about aliens being so advanced that they are past war, past subjugating people, um, that they have peace or whatever, right? And like, whether it's, you know, Daryl Anka channeling Bashar or, Mm -hmm. you know, the law of one or any of these other people channeling, what's the one thing or these messages you hear from aliens You know, the message is, you know, what do you want to tell humanity, which is the number one question for most people. I got a buddy who started off on a cattle mutilation case in Trinidad, Colorado. Oh, my goodness. And the investigation has taken him and uh, a psychic he's been working with, Mama Sue is her name, into incredible places, right, where telepathic messages have been received now. And it's about, hey, get your act together, Mm -hmm. love, peace, environment, right? And it's always been this way, right? It's just interesting. And when you look at that common thread and you pull it a little further, to me anyway, basically that's saying we are using all of this stuff as a mirror for what we hope we look like in the future. Because I go on paranormal investigations because I want to talk to the dead, right? And why do I want to talk to the dead? Because I don't want to just die, man. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like when we die, I don't think it's lights out. Yeah, And so what we are doing is we are seeking our future, right? And to me, it's a beautiful thing, right? And, you know, I go down the rabbit hole. We can go down the rabbit hole of alchemy tonight. We can go down ufology. We can go down, you know, you know the history of ghosts. We can do, you know, the CE, you know, the close right, encounters. Right all the the classifications, we could do any of that stuff. And that's what's so beautiful about all this stuff. It never gets old. It's it's imbued with mystery. And it's endlessly fascinating. It's completely changed who I am as a stand-up comedian over the years. Um, Sure. You you, you write about what you love and, and what you're into. And, and so some people think my comedy is a little weird, I suppose, but um, you know, it's, Talk to me in 10, 15 years and tell me if it's weird or if it's just hack now, so, right? Or just mainstream. I was about to say, your jokes just might be like Michael J. Fox <laughs> and Back to the Future where you're just ahead of time, like bringing them Chuck Berry, and you're like, uh, you don't know this song, but your kids are going to love just it. Just to add you know? a note, like, Ryan has a stand-up special, Supernatural, filmed in a haunted school. So that's amazing. very, very unique. You don't see that every day. You guys should definitely go check that out. Uh, we'll have, a, you know, we can add that into the links as well. Um, it's a great special. Uh, I loved it. Um, but, you know, there's just not, there's no one doing comedy like that. That mixes, I, we're kind of stand-up geeks. I got introduced to stand-up when I was a Richard Pryor and, uh, you know, on HBO watched uh, so much stand-up as a kid. And uh, so combining both of those with with what you talk about on stage and just everything we have going on down here, it's just it was so good, man. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I the original idea was we were going to bus a bunch of people or a small audience to a cabin in the woods, and we were going to film the special. <laughs> Jesus. And then after then, Jesus. Logistically, oh, we're like, man. this might not. This might be a huge headache and a nightmare technically right so i happened to i was performing in my hometown dayton ohio where i grew up uh, i do every every christmas like i'll be there december 22nd 23rd uh at wiley's comedy club in dayton nice and the there was this guy at the show 
and he was there with his son and afterwards, and I get this question all the time uh, from an audience member after a show. They'll, they'll say, are you really into this stuff or are you just making jokes? And I always have to be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm into this stuff. You know, like, you know, I dated a woman who could shapeshift. I've been screamed Whoa, at by wait, a, wait, wait. By a, by a monster, stop. right? Stop. So we'll get back to that, I promise. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, do I, so I'm like really into this. He goes, well, I've got a place I want to take you. It's close to Dayton. It's called Post Town Elementary School. It's famously wow. haunted, this place. It's often called like one of the crossroads of the parent, of spirit, a spirit crossroads, like a, almost like a train station. Fair enough. Like Grand Central Station. Ellis Island type thing. And yeah, it is, <laughs> it is bonkers active. It's, I've probably been there six times now to investigate since uh, my special. Uh, because the first two nights, what I did is I, I got the place for three nights when I did the Supernatural. Yeah. Uh, and the first two nights, me and some friends of mine, did paranormal investigations for the first two days. Wow. And then on the third night, I filmed the comedy special. Wow. So I was like, I told my friends, I was like, I really want to get some good, because <laughs> I'm, I'm so making rad. a documentary series called cool. The Bridge. And cool. I was like, I really want to get some good stuff, but I don't want it to be so good yeah. that I am absolutely terrified and won't perform. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, you know, because we had this whole, we had the, you know, I had like one of my favorite stand up comedy special directors, Stephen Fine Arts, was directing the special. And I was like, so all these people were coming in. And, and we crewed up locally up in Dayton and Cincinnati. And then I was like, but if, if I'm, if I get, if I, because I can get scared. I, <laughs> I am a. So I'm with you. I am I'm a with scared. <laughs> I totally. tell people I'm a scared boy, right? Like yeah. uh, I get scared very easily, yeah. um, because I believe in this stuff. Sure, right. Well, you got to respect. Well, you don't want to have something a, follow you home. Yeah. You don't. Uh, none you know, of that. You're I'm curious. always like, hey, let me go with a Native American yeah. shaman. I need the sage. I need the Palo Santo. I need to make sure. Like, yeah, bring a Reiki nothing. healer everywhere you go. Yeah, right. Uh, or do. Yeah, it's. I don't do demon hunting. I, if yeah, I smell I sulfur, do. I'm out. Dude. Right, like I'm not going to mess with sulfur. That. Sulfur, sulfur is a, no typically good. it's a yeah. sign that there's a demonic force there or an, ent- an entity there. Copy that. Um, okay. If you smell sulfur, it's usually it's either my mom burning breakfast <laughs> or there's a demon. Damn. And some people might say that there's not much of a difference between. Them. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you smell sulfur in a haunted location, I would leave. I'm not one of those people that's going to, I, you know, I say stay woke, don't provoke. Like, I don't go into haunted locations being like, you know, I'm here. Mm-mm. Let's see what you, you know, Mm-mm. I try my best not to ever, like, venture into that territory. Right. Yeah. If a ghost can knock a book off a table, it can pinch your larynx. Right. Right. It's affecting physical space. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we had your boy Matthew Jackson on. He goes pretty hard. Love Matthew Jackson. He's a great dude. We had such a good time talking to him. And and how we kind of met him and met you all at the same time was very, very weird and a, a really cool sync up. But, right. man, he is so cool. We're, we, he oh. and, we're trying to link up and, and go out to Columbus, Indiana. That's where my brother's from. So that's kind of how I got I'm in. And, when you're and so going maybe we can all hook up. It's a cool and, spot. It's yeah, a cool the Crump, place. right? The Crump. Uh, we did a very impromptu kind of quick afternoon investigation before I had a show in the basement of this great place called Viewpoint Books. Okay. Uh, Beth, who owns Viewpoint Books in Columbus, India, it, it's a magical bookstore, mm-hmm. uh, independently owned. they got this basement where there's kind of a performance space. So we did the investigation to the Crump, and then a little bit later, I went, we went over and did the show. And Matthew also does poetry. He's a poet. Yeah. So. Right. Um, Matthew and my buddy Jeff Bodart, who lives out there, is a very funny comic. Uh, the two of them were on the show, opened up the show, and then we did that. But um, the Crump is really cool. Damn. And this was before it was officially opened up again. But they would still do, I think, investigations and stuff there. But um, we there was some wild stuff that happened in that afternoon investigation. Mm. Now, I don't think I'm really at the lid. It's not my story to tell. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but it involves Matthew and one of his other partners who have been to some the most famous of all paranormal locations, mm. um, something specifically there. But so it was pretty wild. Mm. 
Yeah, I'm 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 good with some of those situations. I'm with you. I'm pretty careful myself. Like I'm not trying to dive in. Honestly, that's why I kind of got into ancient civilizations and more of the esoteric kind of spiritual journey. And you know, started getting interested in crystals. I know you're you're very interested oh, yeah. in crystals. We'll talk about your app because I'm fascinated with that. Um, it's and so uh, a lot of those things, like you were talking about earlier, is just. The conspiracies, a lot of that stuff gets really heavy. So I kind of started going into a similar direction, I think, that you ended up. But the same thing with, like, the ghosts and the hauntings. And you start looking into demonology and some of that stuff. It gets real, real heavy. Yeah. So right around that time, I started learning about, you know, ancient civilizations and then eventually Ohio Earthworks and some of that to kind of, like, boost my spirit up. You know, Yeah, it can get dark. And yeah. uh, more than that, it can become... It can become hopeless. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've had, I remember I was really into conspiracy theories about 20 years ago. Yeah. And I've seen it. And then I got someone very close to me. I got them into it. And it essentially it ruined their life. Yeah. And I've seen what it does. I've seen how it can, it can grip you Mm -hmm. and it can take you to a hopeless and a dark place. Mm -hmm. And, Essentially, at the end of the day, I'm not looking for any more excuses to not take accountability for myself or to not be the answer I'm looking for in the world. Um, Most recently, probably Bernie Sanders was my guy. Bernie's going to do it, man. (laughs) Bernie's going to make all the change and he's going to do all the things that I want to do in this world, but Bernie's going to do it. And then when Bernie wasn't the guy, then I'm like, oh, I... I got to do stuff now, right? Like I have to be accountable for my actions in the world and try to make the world a better place, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But um, it's interesting take. But it's but now it's like, well, aliens. You know, it's like okay, <laughs> let's settle down. I put all my eggs in the Bernie basket when that didn't work out. Now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit back and wait for the aliens to fix everything. <laughs> but it's like you can't do that. It's or I can't um, do that anymore, right? And it's it's a hopeless thing. We're looking to be saved, and instead of realizing that. We're the ones in charge of saving ourselves. Yep. 100%. And collectively, each 100%. other. 100%. Right? 100%. It makes me think of how I used to sit and wait for things to happen. Be like, oh, it's just going to happen. I realized one day, nothing's going to happen for me. You have to go make things happen for you. If you want to, again, be that change that you want to see type motif, you have to actually go do it. It mm-hmm. requires that. Like, But it's this aha moment that you realize at certain points. But to that point, even of the Bernie Sanders thing, it would be like, Realizing, like, we can uh, have people we admire that we think are going to do this or that or whatever, but, like, really even in that vein of, like, just, he, that's great. Even if he was going to go do it, great. But while you're doing it, I'm going to do it as well with you. We're, exactly. we're all going to do it, not just wait on you. Like, let's go do it. Yeah, and that's, to me, that's the biggest, and not just conspiracy theories, just to yeah, be clear. I yeah. don't want to, yeah. you know, Oh, absolutely. I don't want to bang on those, but all day long. But the... Um, and it makes sense why certain conspiracy theories are intertwined within the world of the paranormal, because mm-hmm. of you know of cover up of things like that. There's some wild ones. Yeah, there are. And the, but to that point, like I just don't like the effect of anything making people feel powerless. Because when yeah. you start to be like, well, the the Illuminati or you know the you know the cabal or you know <laughs> I'm not in control of anything because they're doing this yeah. right. Um, it's any time that the sensation of of you know disempowering a person mm-hmm. uh, is to me something I will bang against and I'll rail against that kind of stuff all day long because that we can't we can't have that because I mean I I want people to feel empowered uh, as opposed to disempowered sure. and, and the face of the thing can change whether it's the the thing that disempowers or the the alleged savior. Uh, when someone does feel disempowered. For me, it was Bernie Sanders. For some people, it's Trump. You know, it's like mm-hmm. it, the face, the mask is different. I love that point But it's point always the same. Yep. It's the same idea. They are going to fix it. They are yep. going to save us, Yeah. right? As opposed to us realizing we are in charge of that and yeah. we have the power to do it. Mm-hmm. But, But it's like, oh, man, when you start getting into like, you know, I I just remember about, what is it, 15 years ago, I was like, I kind of had this idea. I was like, sooner or later, there's gonna everything's going to be conspiracy. 
<laughs> that's going to be a problem. Yeah. And um, I have to like extricate worse. myself from yeah. the mud, right? And um, and then, but to be fair, not everything is just a conspiracy theory. There are conspiracies. Yeah, and, that's what I, yeah, and, good point. You know, so it's, you know, the broad generalization of anything is is where we start getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. And because I've seen things, I know that the world is not what I thought it was previously. Uh, we can go back to the my origin story, if we want. With Please the, do. Please do. So this was many years ago. I was living in Los Angeles, California. It was probably, it was over 15 years ago now. But there was a woman I met, and we started seeing each other. And at the time, this is going to sound crazy, and it's fine. Uh, I'm telling you, it's fine that I'm going to sound crazy right now. But I, I, I had this weird sensation that I would feel in the back of my brain, right? And whenever I felt it, it's like the bottom base of my skull. Like there was always some kind of big change that was going to happen in my life, right? So I just got to calling it, oh, there's a lizard in my brain. Well, the reptilian part of your brain. Right. So I'm like, there's a lizard in my brain trying to get out. And so I'm, uh, it might've been the first night we hung out. I tell her I got a lizard in my brain, right? Uh, Maybe I wasn't great with boundaries back then, but so I go, I go, I got a lizard in my brain. She goes, you're you're weird, right? And I go, yeah, I, I, I've been told that. And she goes, well, okay, well, then I can tell you this because you're such a weirdo. I can tell you this and not feel so weird. And then she went on to explain how throughout her life she would experience uncontrollable physical changes that made her, some people in her family think she was the devil, um, made her very uncomfortable. She didn't like it. She didn't understand it. And she had no control over it. And didn't know when it would happen. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> right? I was like, I was like, this is the best I'm, night of my life. I'm in. Right? And so, and she goes, you say that now, but uh, wait till it happens and then we'll see what song you're singing. I'm like, you don't got to worry about me. You're good. Right? That's Cut to, oh, what, a couple weeks later, maybe. That's so funny. Uh, it happens for the first time. And... You know, at the risk of being risque, we were laying in bed after, you know, we'd enjoyed a moment. Yeah. And uh, and this woman was of, you know, what's the, okay, let me paint the picture here. So she was about maybe 5'2". She was kind of a, a petite lady of Middle Eastern descent. And we're laying in bed, and, and I look away, and then I look back. And she looks like a blonde-haired white woman. Shut up. That what? I, Stop. That wait, I went to wait. Like, Already, wait. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Like, that I just... used to know when I was younger. Wait. And this is in we're, when we're in bed after we've just had sex. And so it was shocking. And I, <laughs> Mr. Oh, this is the best night of my life, yeah, now you're... turns into... <laughs> what's happening, what's happening, what the, what's happening, what, you know, I freak out. I have what can only be described as, you know, I was on the brink of a full-fledged mental breakdown, right? I believe you. So I get into a state where I'm kind of like, what's happening, what's happening, boom, she was back pretty instantaneously. It was boom, boom. It was that fast. And then she's like, what's going on? Did it happen? Did it happen? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, And I I just kept saying, like, where am I right now? And she was, you're in my apartment. I was like, well, where's your apartment? She's like, Los Angeles, California. I was like, where is Los Angeles, California? She's like, Cal- you know, in the United States. I'm like, where's the United States? She's like, in North America. I'm like, where's North America? She's like, on the planet Earth. I'm like, where's the planet Earth? Wait. She's like, the Milky Way galaxy. And I was like, where am I? And she's like, you're in my apartment. So we kept going. <laughs> you know. Right back full circle. <laughs> and so we kept, and I'm like rocking on the end, end edge of the bed as she's holding me, right? Is that almost this poor, like this poor gal coming back from a DMT trip or something like that, where all of a sudden, like you're coming back into your body, or maybe it's like a this was like much like more weird, like you're disconnected from this. Yourself. Was unlike my DMT, like when I had done DMT, like this was they in no way were like the sensation was very different. This was very jarring and not uh, peaceful or insightful in any way, right? This was rattling and uh, melting of everything that I thought was my anchor in reality. Wow. When, when I just, Burton, thank you. When so this much. happened, okay, so moment happens, you're in the room, whatever. 
how long after the moment happened? Like, I, I just want to get real specific on the details and timelines, <laughs> sure like a do. like a court reporter. So <laughs> I'll do my best. It's but, been nearly I'm just trying 20 to figure years. out because like how quickly did it all happen? Okay, yeah, so. like was it like, oh, hey, this happened. Then you look over and like it happens immediately, or it's like an hour later or 20 minutes. No, this later, is or? like okay, so. Sorry, I don't mean we'll, to get We'll so leave specific, off the first but... part about what we were doing right before it happened. That's fair. In my reenactment. And, uh, <laughs> although it would be very quick. It would be a very short reenactment. And so I look away. I'm just kind of laying in bed on my back. I kind of look off up to the ceiling to the side. And I look back to say something. Boom. She's different. I jump up. I freak out immediately. Okay, so like movie quality and she's strange. like, what's going on? What's going on? And she's her again. Right. And then that's, and I'm like, where am I? What's going on? What's okay. Going on? She's like, okay. Happen. okay. It's all that quick. Okay. Gotcha. And then I, uh, much to my disappointment, I grabbed my things and left. Why do you say to your disappointment? Because that's not, you, you know, so Mr. You like, I bad. can't wait to see this. This yeah. is going to be awesome. You think and we had just had sex. You she was my girlfriend. Jumping we out. had something pretty crazy just happen, and I abandoned the situation instead of moving through it. Staying in it, working yeah. through it. I'll say this. And as seeing if, what happens. If, if she's apparently dealt with this before. Yeah, she said. Wait till it happens. Again, I'm sure she probably took a little hit from that, right? Like, that's what you're saying. Yeah, like, and you, I thought you, I was you, I was hoping I would be a different. I'd be different. You'd be able to force that. I'd be that. to show her that, like, hey, there's nothing wrong with you. And I will react in a way that will show you. That it's okay to be who you are and what this is that you have, yeah. even though you don't know what it is. And I'll be that guy. And then when and it happened, I was not that guy. And did you ever talk to her again? Yes. Okay. So uh, she was quite upset with me. She was. After I left because we had, I mean, we're talking within, this all happened from me seeing the change to me grabbing my things and being out the door. This is probably within... If I had to guess, I, I'm going to say five to ten minutes of us just having had sex, right? Yeah. So the very intimate thing. And I'm, boom, and now I've just abandoned her, right, after that. Very vulnerable state. Sure. So she was upset about that. Sure. Um, we were supposed to, but we, we start communicating again. We're supposed to go out again. Uh, and then I have a voicemail or a, a message that just says, I can't do it. It's happened again. I can't get together. It's happened again. And so I was like, not this time, Ryan. Right? So I'm like, I'm going to go make sure she knows it's okay. So I just drove over to her apartment. Um, and I, you know, I'm like, I'm, I you know, called. I'm like, I'm outside your door. And so eventually she lets me in. And she's wearing, like, shorts and this giant sweatshirt. And... Uh, I go, what's going on? What's going on? And she goes, uh, and she explains the situation. She goes, I was at work, and she's a rocket scientist, worked for an aerospace company. Jeez. Like some of the things she's developed are in satellites in space right now. And she says, there's this woman I work with. She walked by my desk, and she's like nine months pregnant. She's ready to pop. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, she looks so happy. Wouldn't that be great to be pregnant? Um, and be happy like that. And then the woman walks off or whatever. And she says, you know, shortly after that, she starts getting bigger mm -hmm. and her clothes become tighter. And she realizes, oh, I'm becoming pregnant right now. And so she calls her boss. I was like, uh, you know, I ate something bad. I got to go. <laughs> she gets out of work. What? And so she I'm with you. I'm already with you. I'm just she becomes, right now. I'm with she you. She becomes pregnant uh, at work. And so I go, are you telling me you're st like do you still look pregnant and she lifts up this giant sweatshirt and it looks like this tiny gal looks like she's swallowed a beach ball shut up wow and you saw physical proof later so on. so i touched it i uh, put my ear up just to see if i could hear a baby <laughs> of any kind right um because <laughs> i'm like it's probably my if this is a like a rapid pregnancy of some like paranormal nature it's your like, like Jesus we have Christ. to like it's your protect our child. It's his from the other day. Like, we have Khalil. Like you know, like we are having like a superhuman, <laughs> and I have to make sure that or it's Ted Brogan. We protect our child. No. Come out thirty four <laughs> with a mustache. <laughs> I, I, I honestly I didn't think that it was like she was pregnant oh. with my child. I just right. thought she was 
changed. But there's something um, going on. It didn't on there. occur to me at all. I mean, we're kidding, but strange. There was zero thing. part of me that thought my child's in. Right, there. right, right. So, um, oh my gosh. But there's something there physically. Oh yeah, you something's can see. there. And so, and I'm just fascinated by it this time, and which was kind of a healing moment from the first time, mm-hmm. and and they were like, well, there's no way you're truly pregnant, and so let's celebrate. And so we get a bottle of wine, drink a bottle of wine, have a good night. Wake up the next morning, and she's back to normal. Wow. And we didn't date much longer because, as you can imagine, our relationship was so supercharged with, like, high-intensity moments that it was... We were kind of like a, a, a brilliant, bright firework going mm-hmm. on. We had our moment in the sky, and then it was just like, okay, we this isn't... It probably isn't going to work between us. And so, but what's interesting is, and what is a theme in a lot of paranormal experiences, is people don't talk about their shared experiences together. And we didn't really talk about these things, right, that it happened. Cut to, I don't know, whatever it is, five years later, seven years later, whatever, I start my podcast. And I, I'm still in contact with her at the time. So we, I reach out and I'm like, I'm starting this podcast. I'll never mention your name ever. Uh, I will only include information about you that you're comfortable with, blah, blah, blah. Right. She's like, okay. She's like, yeah, just never say who I am ever. Right. And so, uh, so that happens. And then a few years after that, and I start off my podcast, the very first episode of my podcast is just an episode called Origins. Or it's a 15-minute episode of me saying, this is why I believe in the paranormal in a very deep way, as opposed to just before, when I mm-hmm. believed that this stuff was real. Um, and I will never talk to her. I'll never interview her. She'll never do that, mm-hmm. whatever. Cut to years later, I'm traveling. She reaches out. I was like, oh, why don't you come stay at my house if you, you have an off night? She's living in the middle of nowhere off the grid at this point. She's no longer working in aerospace. She's had too many experiences where she's had, you know, her apartment was turned over, walked into a parking lot, and there were men in suits there going through her car. What? Mm. She's had all kinds of crazy stuff happen. Wow. So <clears throat> she's off the grid in the middle of nowhere at this point. And I go there, and we have a couple of really cool synchronicities happen immediately. And then she goes, you know what? Grab your microphones if you've got them. And I go, are you kidding me right now? I'm not here to try to get you on my podcast. I'm just here to see you. And maybe we can talk about... Because I brought it up. I go, can we talk about what happened? Because you're the only person I experienced it with. And my friends know. And I've been doing a podcast now for a little while. But am I crazy? I need that, yeah. Am I? Have I been lying to myself and I started a podcast on lies, like a fantasy? Or, sure. I have false memories from my childhood. Sure. That never happened. Sure. I'm, a, I'm creative. I'm yeah. imaginative. Yeah. I could have made this all up, but I want to, I want to know now so yeah. I can get out in front of it and be like, right. hey, everybody, by the way, I just thought I dated a woman who could shapeshift. So uh, wow. turns out, not really, but... Um, so she goes, yeah, we can talk about it. And so we start talking about it. And that's when she goes, you know what? Just go grab your microphones. And I go, are you serious? Mm. That's not what I'm here for. I'm just here to try to not feel insane. Yeah, I just need to know where because base level is. Right? Yeah. Because, I mean, especially when you have a really intense... Um, and I don't think any paranormal experience is better than another. Sure. Right? But you definitely hear about shape-shifting experiences a lot less than you do ghost encounters or Sasquatch sightings, things Mm -hmm. like this. It has been very difficult for me to find anybody who has any kind of experience that... uh, The only one I've got is the Billy Corgan interview from Howard Stern. Well, yes. Where he talks about his experience, and it's like... It's it's Sounds a lot like And I think I might know who that shape-shifter is. What we but, just covered this on our other show, did you? Strange Happenings. Like, yeah, that's why when three, you started going down, ago. this I was like, I am. Oh, we're so in, so uh, in. That's uh, why I'm not. It's talking. a long shot, but I think I might have information for you. Wow, that would be amazing. So anyway, uh, it's been Jesus. very difficult for me to. I've met a few people now who have 
uh, over the years. Because basically the podcast was me putting out a, a call. Mm -hmm. right? Like, without me like having to say it, say it, it's been like, hey, you know? I need some, some kind of verification you know, of what's going on shifting has here. always been too far out the box for even some of the most paranormal diehards. They're like, okay, yeah. you lost me at Shapeshifter, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I mean, well, I like to I like to look at soft disclosure, and I always think of the Men in Black movies where he's like, no, he blinked. He blinked, you know. Mm -hmm. There's all these little things. There's all these subtle things that you hear over the years, again, from the conspiracy, conspiracy side of it, but... It's oh, wow. one of those, how much do we know and how far do we know? And we have to, again, give ourselves a little bit of space to go, yes, we've got this figured out and that figured out and this figured out. But do we have everything figured out? Do we no. really know and, and how will, to? And, and you can't measure. Thankfully, we don't. No. You can't measure and we never everything. Will. Like, no. Materialistic science wants to be able to measure everything. If you can't put it in a box, put it on a scale, yeah. it's not real. It doesn't exist. But what? there are certain things that you, you know, unfortunately, you just can't put on a scale. I got to know. Maybe someday we'll have the technology to measure it. I got to know what happened with when she was like, fine, just I get your micro. Say, get, with, well, that episode is out there. It's, okay, I'm going uh, yeah, to have to listen to it. It's, it's experience. Well, I call them experiences, the interviews. It's experience number 76. Uh, I think yeah. it's just called Interview with a Shapeshifter or Origins Interview, I think is what it's called. Yeah. But it's by far my most popular episode, sure. as you might imagine. Well, uh, I think it's first and second is the live, I call them the DMT couch sessions. First time I smoked DMT with my buddy Shane Moss, we recorded it. So wow. uh, it's me smoking DMT for the first time uh, right on. We're recording. And then him also. But anyway, shape uh, the interview with her is by far the most favorite. And it's... Um, you know, I, I always have that, right? I There's a couple parts of that interview that people people hate because, well, one part they people hate because she goes, can I tell you the truth about everything, but uh, you have to stop recording for a second? And I go, yeah. Mm. And then we come back after she told me. But um, And people are like, how can you do that? Oh, man. And I'm like, well, I can't put anything in yeah. that she doesn't want in. But, and spoiler alert, you don't want to know what she said anyway, because it'll ruin your night. But um, if not many nights after, because it's been a very difficult life for someone like her. And do we fully understand what the phenomena is that she's experiencing? I can't say for sure that we do. Uh, there's speculation about uh, potential gin lineage in her family. Um, there's, you know, some people think, oh, she's, you know, they'll message, she's got an attachment, it's clear, clearly she has an attachment, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, yeah. you can speculate that if you want, and that's fine. But um, she's been down that road, and we don't believe so. But, so we don't know. And and sadly, I'm, I'm no longer in contact with her. Um, and, you know, life goes on. Yeah. And people have to move on. Although, I, although you could say that maybe I haven't moved on <laughs> as much as, as she has, but yeah. um, because I, you know, I dedicate such a large part of my life now to trying to understand the world that Based was cracked that. open for yeah. me mm -hmm. in such a profound way. And people will always tell me, they'll be like, you know, if I didn't know you, I'd think this was crazy. Yeah. Because when you don't, and it's just, that's just the way it is with so many things in life, when if you know someone, for some reason, my story has much more credibility when someone knows me. Or if I, because they're like, oh, you're not just crazy all the time. <laughs> you know, all you want to do is talk about eggnog and milkshakes most of the time and baseball cards uh, and the paranormal <laughs> stuff. Like, you seem to be a, re you pay all your bills on time. Right. You've never been evicted. Like, you don't seem like you're bonkers. Uh, so I do I have to believe this? I guess I do, maybe. Right? So for me, that's what it's all about. It is trying to create a bridge between the unbe unbelievable and the believable for people. And I didn't set out to talk about all this stuff in my stand-up. Really, I didn't make a conscious decision one day and be like, I'm going to be the blah, blah, blah. But it has been really encouraging over the years when people will be like, oh, I'm so glad you're... I can't believe you're talking about that on stage. Uh, especially when I talk about the shapeshifter on stage. If I When I bring that up, that is... Me asking a lot from an audience. Oh, I bet. Unless they're specifically <laughs> there because of a paranormal theme or something, which I don't usually do paranormal themed 
when I'm out on the road doing comedy clubs and things like that. So that's asking a lot for an audience to go along. That's why you don't you don't open with it. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be so many people would be it's so the intro locked. Line. what yeah, the like, hell yeah. what just happened Did we I mean, just sign up for I, I oh, just find man. it interesting how you're like how how like basically this started you down this path because it it just shook your paradigm so hard because I get it right, right? like but also the whole you've been the weird kid teenager adult right like we get that I don't think we heard a lot growing up like your normal Mikey bub like it was the same kind of vibe of they're just strange <laughs> but that's Nothing normal is interesting to us at a certain level. I watched some football this weekend. That's fine. Whatever. That doesn't really get me going. Yeah. Conversations like this make me go, holy cow. Well, like, yeah. There's something behind the curtain that I'm interested in finding out what's back there at certain points. We love mystery. Yes. We're seekers of mysterious things. And, you know, curious nature, I suppose, because it wasn't stifled. It was encouraged, hopefully. Uh, by others around us and by ourselves at some point. You have mm-hmm. to take responsibility for encouraging yourself. Like, I've been really trying to lean into these things, and, like, I try to love the individual parts of my body now, mm-hmm. which is, you know, like, I know I'm getting older because I'm, like, moisturizing my feet. Like, who would do <laughs> such a, like, who would do such a thing? And But I, like, thank my feet for they've carried me through they, this life right. for Ooh, 47 years. A lot and, of miles. You know, and... And so I'm just trying to be very thankful. I'm trying to be grateful, uh, maintaining curiosity. I'm very grateful for mystery. Uh, without mystery, there there may be no joy for me. I don't know. I don't want to have the answers to everything. And Fair that enough. doesn't mean I don't want to find the answers to all these things, because I do. Because I also know that finding the answer to one thing will lead to two more questions. Mm-hmm. And just like any great like drama or mystery TV show, Right, they solve one problem, but little did they know by solving that problem that they thought would take care of everything, it opens up two more problems they now have to solve. Mm-hmm. Which is for me, that's great television. But um, and it's also kind of a great life to live, and yeah. it's taken me to places where I never knew I would go. And quite frankly, I, you know, I've had it all hasn't been fun and games for me. Um, uh, you know, I've, there's a therapist I see. I've seen him for three and a half years now. But the reason I went and saw him was because of a paranormal experience Mm. that's different than this one because it was so traumatic for me. Mm. So, I mean, we do have to be careful because we open ourselves up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that old saying, like, you got to be careful. Like, if you're too open, you might just spill out. Your whole brain might spill or whatever the old saying is about making fun of open-minded people who will believe anything, right? Because they're stupid. Oh. Um, But we're entering a world now where soft disclosure is happening. Oh, it's coming. Uh, I do think that there's a shift in consciousness. I'm a huge idealist. So I believe that the foundation of the universe is consciousness and everything else is built on top of that, which is, you know, the opposite of what the materialistic, you know, scientific world is. But, and it's convenient for me to think that because it's, a, it's you know, we talked about the holographic universe before I was, we started yeah, recording. Appreciate you bringing it up, yep. Uh, Michael Talbot, I mean, R.I.P. Michael. Or, right. You know, yeah. In the after form, right? It's, that book blew my mind. Uh, my buddy Tom Simmons, a very brilliant, funny comedian, turned me onto that book, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, whenever it was. And you do have to do some research on some of the characters right, yeah. in that book. Oh, right. yeah. That ended up not being so great. But, um, yeah. but that, beside the point. The the idea right is 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 beautiful, and then and then you get into idealism, and I'm not big into certain aspects of idealism, like that there has to be a god mind, yeah. you know, like you know, I I don't how we things don't, have to work right, yeah. So, but having said all that, I don't think there's that much of a difference between anything at all. And I'm talking about everything in the world here, everything in our perception. So I know when I did the Post Town special, the Supernatural, and the idea of the paranormal investigation that I was running in tandem with recording the comedy special was that I wanted to show the best way I could, or at least attempt to, that consciousness is the connective tissue between all paranormal phenomena. So we could do CE5 protocols which are close encounters of the fifth kind, uh, you know, human-initiated contact with ETs or extraterrestrial intelligence, we could do CE5 protocols inside of a haunted school that is famously haunted, and we could get results 
with ghosts because basically all of this stuff is the same. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that in a generic, like, boring way, but, you know, right. because... Like, ETs being interdimensional, ghosts being f- higher, lower dimensions. I mean, it's it's sort of just shifting energy, right? Or, you know... Yeah, and we're physical? part of this, too. Right. And, and, you know, we're somewhere on this grid of things or these, you know, somewhere in this Tron maze, right? So, and I think that consciousness connects all of the dimensions, connects all of the things, all the people. So... You know, when, when you talk about CE5 specifically, and I don't know if you guys have done it. Um, Never done it, but... But, it, you know, it's, it's meditation and consciousness-based. It's all about intention, right? And, you know, setting up boundaries also, but, you know, it's, it's cool stuff. Um, and, you know, so we do like a version. So we did kind of a version of it. Like I didn't go strict, strict, right? Which some people might be like, you shouldn't be doing that or whatever, right? But I'm not... I'm not trying to like bastardize what Dr. Stephen Green mm-hmm. is doing or right, you right. Know, the things like that, the protocols in any way. But anyway, the point is that the CE5 protocols essentially are when, – when, if you watch videos of people doing it or listen to Dr. Greer talking about it, if you've ever been on – when people go on paranormal investigations, you're seeing like, oh, this, this is similar. These are similar things. And if you've been out in the woods trying to find Sasquatch, like mm-hmm. I have been. You're right. You're, you're like, saying, yeah. oh, this is this rings familiar. We uh, th- It has basic tenets of intention, consciousness, uh, getting into a state, um, whether it's communicating through telekinesis or just broadcasting your signal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever it is. Shamanic ceremonies are of purpose. Shamanic ceremonies. Yes. Exactly. So to so me— So in a case, yes, I have done that then. Yeah. It's a, it, it feels very similar. If you've ever meditated and tried to connect with spirit guides, you have done essentially a version of a paranormal investigation, a CE5 protocol meditation uh, to initiate contact— or you've been out in the woods looking for Sasquatch. And, you know, to me, it's all... So I was like, we are going to blow this thing. Because the CE5 protocols... I mean, Dr. Greer has done... To me, I'm a huge... I like that. I, I'm a. I'm here for him. Mm-hmm. Right? And some people are like, oh, his shorts are too tight. And it's like, well, get over it. <laughs> get over it. If you were jacked, if you had guns, jacked, you'd dude. be tightening he's, those he's shorts too. He's in bad shape, yeah. He's he stays in shape. Jacked. He stays in you shape. Know, and he's... He's done so decades of dedication to the cause, which to me is is mind blowing. I've watched, I watched Sirius. Yeah, I've so watched much. Beyond uh, Disclosure. I've I have his books. Uh, I Contact. I was into that for quite a while. I have followed him. I know he's taken some flack over the years, and it, there's. I think it leads back to one of the things you said earlier of the two of like, but the kind of like I own this space or I'm in charge of this sort of vein of the paranormal or this is my arena. It's like, I don't think I have dominion over anything and they're all theories until we can prove any of these things. Right. So when people are like, well, I'm right and you're right, you know, I don't get yeah, into any of that. It's really yet. silly to me. It's like, do you want the truth to be known to the it's world or do you want to be famous for the, being the guy who discovered something like right who cares man? right i just like, want to know yeah. the answers yeah. i just want to know the answer that's all and i want because it's to me disclosure is probably the biggest human rights issue that 100%. we face in the entire world yeah which i know i don't want to sound insensitive what's going on in the world right now but what i'm saying is it's I, such an overreaching world changing perception turn off all problems shift. instantly it's the technology <laughs> right. the technology alone right. can change the whole planet overnight and yeah. they've been holding that back. But that that's, could, and to say, well, we're not ready for it consciously. Yeah. How can we be ready for it consciously? If we've been lied to about all this stuff. How can we evolve consciously yeah. to be able to accept this technology and use it without people just freaking out or trying to control it in some way? So, yeah. yeah and for me, it's also it's a, a thing line. about, you know, I do my damnedest to stay away from, uh, Things that get me too fired up. Oh God! Right? And it's fair it's, enough. It's impossible. Um, I need oh. to do better. And that. I'm very passionate about things. And I get too. Fu- Sometimes I'll put out a podcast, and a week later I'll be like, God, maybe I should oh, take boy. that down. <laughs> I was really going in on that. Yeah. But um, I've had but some for me, it's. Recently. <laughs> You know, this is the reason why I love the paranormal so much. Yeah, it's right? way more it's chill. Because like, right, if, if okay, so let's say we got paranormal town. 
the two main roads that cross through the heart of Paranormal Town are Ghost Boulevard and Alien Avenue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I say that because once we realize that physical death isn't real, that changes everything. And once we realize that we are not alone in the universe, that also just as equally mm-hmm. changes everything. So when those two things in tandem happen together, what you have is a completely different, eventually, we still have to eat, poop, work, etc. It doesn't matter if there's a flying saucer hovering over the White House. You still have to empty your bladder. You right, still need right. to sleep at night. Right. Right. These, you still need to buy food for your family. Right. right. So, but it changes everything. And uh, the thing I'm, I'm just such on, I'm so on the fear of death controlling everything in the world right now. And it's, there's this great book called The Death of Forever, which is a really fascinating book. And, you know, that in accord with, you know, some of these other esoteric, you know, things that we get a hold of, whether it's, you know, Operation Trojan Horse or, you know, all these other books. It's just, or The Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts or, you know, The the Secret Teachings of All Ages by my guy, Manly P. Hall. Oh, yeah. It's just like, okay, so you start, you start just consuming all of this, you know, ancient esoteric mystery school type stuff. You almost right? get lost. Emerald you tablets lost. of both. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and it's, can, and it's It bonkers. happened to me for a while, yeah. I just yeah. got almost disenchanted because I was like uh, almost overloaded. To where somebody goes, why do you feel this way? I don't know anymore because I've read so many different things and I've taken in so much information. My my the way I equate myself is like a weather vane anymore. It's just where the way the information's hitting and blowing, and that's why I'm like this. It's a feeling. It's a gut reaction anymore because it's just kind of washing over at this point. There's just so much. There is so much, but fundamentally, mm-hmm. it is my hope, and I think I'm thinking of this for the first time. But I guess that's what a conversation is. You know, um, never knowing what you might say or what's sure. so interesting, too, is sometimes do you ever feel like, oh, I didn't know I believed that until I just said it just oh, now. Oh, 100%. Well, and you're just like, called, okay, that's called being a person. That's myodic uh, learning. I mean, <laughs> dude. It's myodic. It's something that's what you it's didn't know that you knew. And it's basically, yes, it's it's basically like mirror teaching. It, it is a form of, it's it's from a book called Ishmael, My Ishmael, Story of B. My Udic learning, my Udic oh, okay. teaching. Well, I thought you were talking about Ishmael by Daniel Quinn for a second. It is. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's from Daniel. Da- but that is okay, the philosophy so that's why of my Udic teaching. Is, Can I tell it's you a story about What that, you though. said, Please, you knew yeah. something that you already knew, Yes. but you kind of pulled out of your... That's my Udic teaching. Yeah, and then sometimes I'll say something I'm like, oh, I didn't know I believed that until I just said it. Like, yeah. What? Oh, okay. Yeah. But, okay, so... Great series, by the way. There is... Uh, I don't know when this was, and I can't remember who... Someone recommended Ishmael to me by Daniel Quinn. And so I'm like, okay, I'll read it. So I this was when one of my stop buying books, go to the library, you maniac phases. <laughs> yeah. Right? And I love a library. I think I was probably about 25 when I realized I'd rather go to a library than a bar. And so I was like, okay, so I go to the library to get Ishmael. They have it. So I'm looking for it. I can't find it. I have to get on my hands and knees because it's on the bottom, uh, the bottom rung of the shelf, right? And I, it's an old tattered tattered paperback and I grab it. And the moment I grab this book, I am overwhelmed with such deep, pure emotion. Mm. I start, I don't start weeping in the library, but I am ready. I'm on my hands and knees already. And I'm ready to, I'm ready to cry. Wow. I am like, you know when your face gets red and your eyes are watering and they're just red and that first drop's getting ready to just blunk? And I'm just like, oh, my God, what? I am feeling all of the emotions from all of the people who have read this book and yep. been so deeply moved by it probably. This is what, like my thought in the moment. Mm-hmm. I'm already thinking that while you're saying and it. And so right, I go right. home and I read this book faster than any book I've ever read Outside of Born Standing Up by Steve Martin. Mm. Steve Martin's great. Which I got that for my birthday from a girlfriend at the time. And I, she gave it to me. I opened it. I saw what it was. I started reading it. And I didn't stop until it was done. Um, such a wonderful book. But um, So Ishmael and Born Standing Up, those, those two books were the quickest reads for, as far as... I don't mean like speed reading, but I just meant there was no downtime. Yeah. That book is so good. 
And that's when I first realized like, oh, am I experiencing, which I didn't realize at the time, uh, was clairsentience. Um, hmm. You know, and, and I was like, oh, I definitely had clairsentience here. Because, and this was an old, tattered copy. So I can only imagine there was probably upwards of 50, if probably more people who read that book. And, you know, I don't want to speak for all people, but reading that book, if you are not moved emotionally uh, or spiritually in some kind of way reading that book, yeah. I just think you probably weren't paying attention as you read. Yeah. Do you know how I got that book? I would show up every morning at work when I was still a nurse and it was like seven thirty, eight in the morning was my witching hour for me personally. Cause like, I'm, I, I'm not a morning person. I never was even for all the years I had to wake up early and I would go into work and my brain would start racing. And one of my old coworkers that I worked with, we would get into these wild heated discussions before any real work started, you know, we're just getting over coffee. But when those conversations didn't kick off, it was usually just me coming in and I, I used to oscillate between Everything matters and nothing matters. Everything matters and nothing matters. And it's this whole, why are we here? What are we doing? What's the point of me being here experiencing all this? I was just having that very big, like, macro, micro, everything matters and it doesn't. And what is life and what does this mean? And there was a doctor, one of the residents that came in one morning, and she was just like, what is wrong? And I was just like, because I was just to myself, just kind of like trying to work it out. And she goes, hey, just read this. And she gave me Ishmael. And it just, like you said, so when you said how you felt when you picked up that book, it's just, I, I just started having this kind of nostalgic flashback to, I, I haven't thought about this in maybe a decade or so. It's been a while. So it, it, it really again. set me off because she could tell that I was like, really was just agonizing daily when people would see me and be like, what is your problem? Like, how do you not think about this stuff? Like, how does it not concern <laughs> you? Like. You're here living too. Do you not think about these yeah. things? Like they they yeah. worry me daily. And then after I read that, I had this very different perspective of just not letting that control me daily and just kind of getting to the wheel started turning again. I could get into like doing stuff and and not feeling so kind of like paralyzed by the thoughts, you know. It yeah, it's a great I mean, read. It makes me want to really geek out right now. Uh, and cuz I mean <sighs> I just can't get – sometimes I have these moments and I'm having it right now. I'm experiencing it right now where I just can't get over letters in words, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, I mean, if you think about how cool letters and words are, I mean, these are these abstract – they're these symbols that represent the deepest, most abstract thoughts, feelings, and emotions that we as these – timeless creatures have, right? And it's a very limited toolbox of 26 letters, man. 26 <laughs> letters are supposed to express all that we are, these beings of eternal light, like, right? I, and But it, we do a pretty damn good job. And then there's people like Daniel True. Quinn right. who write a book like Ishmael in such a way that these random combinations of letters and words have such profound effects on other human beings that you cry, you laugh, you, whatever. And it's like the manipulation of these, of these symbols, right? Uh, and I'm not using manipulation in a bad way here. No, 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 no. But I it's get like, you. it's so right. amazing to me. And that's why I love comedy too, because, you know, to me, the best, all great jokes are, you didn't see the, you didn't see the end coming. Yeah, That's what sure. a great joke is. Sure. And it's supposed to elicit laughter, right? And it's supposed to make people, it's supposed to bring people joy, you know, because a laughter, it's like an involuntary reflex sometimes when you hear the perfect joke. <laughs> like the gut buster. That's what every comic wants is like if every joke could be a gut buster. Oh my God. Right. Like, that's what you you're know, searching for. That's what that's you're why searching you go for. back up every That's night. why you go back up. I mean, no comic, every joke they tell is a gut buster, but, yeah. you know, even the greatest of the greats. But um, it's all, it's these letters, it's these words, it's these invisible things, right? And we all have different associations with every single, every single word out there has an individual association. When I say lizard, you see a lizard, you see a lizard, I see a lizard. I bet they're different lizards, right? right? Mine's in my brain, yours is in right. a terrarium, et cetera. <laughs> but the manipulation of these words, right, and the magic that happens when put into the right, right combinations uh, and 
energetically. That's and alchemy. I mean, I was just about to say that with you. Yeah, the symbols of ancient, you know, Egyptian or Aramaic. Imagine reading Aramaic and speaking Aramaic. You're saying like English is a very refined down version of these more ancient languages that are gone. And the symbols alone are giving you emotion and downloads without you even knowing it. You know, yeah, it's like, oh man, I could maybe it's a little bit of the Red Bull, but maybe it's a lot of the conversation <laughs> that we're having. It's, but like, I'm with you is, on the conversation part. Th- yeah. Here's the thing, too. Like, I think about, like, I get okay, I'm getting too fired up over here. I gotta settle down, but like, <laughs> I gotta settle it down over here. But this, like, how could you not devote a lifetime? Any, you could devote a whole entire lifetime to one of the smallest threads that we've pulled here today, right? And you would have a thrilling life right and i just can't i can't stay i can't stay put man but like i can't stay put I'm i can't you, stay bro. put on alchemy island too long because i got to get over to ghost city you know what i mean yeah, yeah but like the problem is too for me it's like i like i think about buying a house and i'm like okay it's got to be on a ley line i gotta have i gotta i gotta I gotta build it. I have to check the geomagnetic map you, on NASA's website. It's gotta be face, it's gotta be face, yeah. face yeah. east. It has to face I'll east. I'll tell you what. I'm the person that doesn't think no, about any of that. He Mikey should, does. Yeah. I somehow don't. Yeah. There needs to be a realtor website that is specifically for strange people. For strange people. But here's the thing. Here's here's the thing about it. Here's strange why. R-E. Here's why I'll say that. Mm. And, and this is maybe why I have, and again, I've never thought about this before, but I believe it to be absolutely true. I believe in the ley lines and the powers and being out in uh, Sedona and even Tom's house by it and all that. I'm not Serpent saying it's mountains. wrong. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I think the thing is, I'm so already charged innately that I just, it's like my wife might find that if she thought it was like even now like you're saying from the conversation is it is it is it from having that no because i've i've had one of those before in a conversation what happens in conversations like this is an energy transfer that's happening basically right yeah no 100% so that's I'm, what's occurring and so, I, and if you're feeling tired i apologize cuz i am tired not, no i was going to say like <laughs> like i'm sucking all of your energy cuz i'm no, jazzed no, no, up no, right no, now no, no it's um, all equally moving through i think it's, no, no, i think yeah. it's basically permeating everywhere no, cuz i feel like yeah. i'm in a hot tub of energy right I, now i don't like, lose energy i'm from basically other bubbling in energy oh yeah cuz i'm not going to lie i was tired earlier cuz this what you know, time shift, everything you know, the 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 procession of the earth and wobbling the sun, and, right? All the darkness, it's uh, that's got me messed up. But this conversation is definitely, but one got of the me things up. too, I I want to like just make sure that you know I'm that I'm clear about one thing specifically, and you know I sometimes over the years I've gotten grief for it. I remember in 2008, I think I I I was uh, I was in a very happy relationship and. I thought this is going to be the death of my comedy mm. because I believe that you had to be miserable to be truly funny, mm. uh, which is an old ancient, you know, unwritten rule in stand up comedy. <clears throat> right? And I realized I was funnier than I'd ever been, maybe because I was working on the craft. But, and I, that's when I realized it was 2008. I was like, so 15 years ago, I was like, oh, I'll be funnier if I'm happy. I don't need, I need to focus on that. And, and people were, I, I got pushback from, friends of mine in comedy mm. about it. And I'm like, you know, cause there's all, there's the old line. Like nobody wants, uh, nobody wants to go see a comedian up on stage talking about how great life their life is. That's different than a comedian going up on stage talking about how great life is or can be right. That doesn't not mean necessarily not, their life, but exactly. Life general, but we're talking sure. more general. Like, yeah. I mean the, you know, awe-inspiring moments, silliness, right, um, things like that. And so I shifted uh, away from that. And and so that's the same kind of thing I want to do with, you know, whether it's my podcast or other things, because it can get so dark, like we were talking about earlier, and, and you can feel helpless. And I feel helpless too sometimes. Mm-hmm. I'm not over here acting like I don't. But we have to, if we lose our hope, we have already lost. And I think importantly, in the world of paranormal and experiencers, it's easy to feel hopeless when you feel like no one believes you. That's a big thing because people ask me all the time, like, okay, so you have over 700 episodes. How many times have someone taken you for a ride? 
How many times have someone lied to you about all this stuff? And yeah. and did you know it when it was happening? And honestly, I can't think of one time where I know for a fact someone was lying to me about their experiences. Mm-hmm. There's been a couple times where even I've been like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. wait, what? Mm-hmm. Right? But But then I quickly remember the faces of very close friends to mine when I first started telling them, about my experience with the woman who could shape shift. And that look of, I mean, I love you and I want to believe you, but, you know. And when I first moved to L.A., it was about 11, 12 years ago, um, I quickly was, at least within certain segments of the L.A. comedy community, I was labeled crazy hmm. because I would talk about this on stage. And, you know, because I would meet people and they'd be like, Even oh. Sam Triboli? <laughs> 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 Sam has never called me crazy. I was about to say. Uh, shocker. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but man. I would meet people who weren't in comedy or something, or <clears throat> they'd be comedy adjacent yeah, or something, and yeah. they'd be like, "Oh, you know, everyone thinks you're crazy, right?" And I'd be like, "Well, I guess that's that's just the way it is." Yeah. Um, but cut to twelve years later, with disclose, you know, the soft disclosure happening mm-hmm. and these other things, and. Um, probably much less so now. Well, there's so many podcasts we where experiencers like Tony Merkel's The Confessionals or, you know, the Sasquatch Chronicles and even your show to to a lot of extent. And, you know, our show's not that. We have interviews. But there's so many avenues. Hollow Sky Night Shift every Wednesday night where you can call. There's a community of people that are in the chat supporting your yeah, story. Yeah, a lot of stuff like You know that. what I mean? So, like, Doppel that, bangers. I think, is totally pushed the wall down for you know, these things becoming more and more accepted. I think it's podcasts and streaming. Yeah. I think I one hundred percent think I so. I think too. that and I gotta say ancient aliens too. I'm sorry. I know it's I don't buy all of the ancient aliens episodes, <laughs> don't get me wrong. It but brought it to I a think mainstream. it brought enough of even like Eric yep. Von Daniken and Chariots of the Gods type of just hey look like we covered the cargo culture, right? Yep. Like cargo planes in, in the wars, these different little islands would be like From, come back. John From. And it was yeah. this pilot dude. And they built these wicker planes and these effigies and would go up to these yeah, tops where they had that. made these runways and they would pray like come back and it's this dude from like kansas yeah he's not a god yeah. he's flying an f- airplane full of supplies during the war like you know so it's just like i think more and more people have at least opened their idea to the fact and it's rolled and it's rolled and again you got will smith every other five years in an alien movie whether it's independence day or men in black this and like, I swear he's the poster child for self-disclosure. Like, I think he's in on it. Oh, that's an interesting idea. You know, Who else do you want to let you know that there's UFOs and aliens? Fresh yeah, right. Prince. Yeah, Fresh Prince. <laughs> you know, it's – and it's it's high time and it's – the times yeah. are rolling. And it's I think podcasts probably – you know, I agree. Had a big thing to do with it, um, becoming just more acceptable in the mainstream. I remember it was about four years ago I pitched a show about – I was like, I want to do a travel show or like an investigation show about, I want, you know, about shapeshifters. And this woman's like, okay, well, first of all, I love it. And second of all, what? <laughs> Dude, now? And you, I go, I you just so I want to, you know, because, I mean, shapeshifting is in the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's in yep. the oldest written recording story we have. There's a shapeshifter in that story. And I was like, there's so much to cover here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I want to go find these people yeah uh you know i'm not trying to capture them in a net or anything like that but you know cut to four years later shape shifting was actually the, one of the main premises of i forget what show it was it was kind of like a twilight type show kind of thing on some series but anyway but it was um where shape shifting was a major component of the thing and now shape shifting is it's not such a weird word Mm-mm. to hear anymore. No. And, uh, you know, so, which is... We grew up reading David Icke. Oh, like okay. the, oh. the reptilian agenda. Where the moon is an amplifier. The moon yeah, is an amplifier. Yeah, we, we got a couple well, of those, a whole couple of those books the, with the, yeah, the reptilian shape. The reptilian agenda, so the lower fourth dimension. That's what the, I think about. The vibrations yeah, I, of your energy and why maybe at certain points you wonder... Why is there so much discourse in the world? Because, again, 
people at a broad level, we all want the same things. We want a roof over our head. We want it to be warm and have indoor plumbing and a fridge full of food. And we want to be able to be safe and comfortable, right? Like that is globally. Everybody wants to be able to go in at night and be able to sleep soundly and whatever, like across the board, right? So why is there so much discourse all the time? How can, and this goes back to even the Ishmael book. That's one of the things about Ishmael that blew me away. First off was like, and I think they use like, well, we have 6 billion people, but we only feed 5 billion people, but we make enough food for 7 billion people. And we just throw, you know, this much away and this much, and then those people. So it's just one of those, like, it doesn't make sense, mathematically speaking. So, yeah. and it's, yeah, I mean, I, cause I remember like, it's such a weird thing when you have like a beautiful confluence of, or if that's the, the right word of where a bunch of books you read kind of all in the same period of time. Mm-hmm. And the way that they all kind of mesh together in mm-hmm. a way you never would have even thought was possible. Right. Yeah. I, like I read, I think I read Guns, Germs, and Steel oh. at the same time I read, or like right before or after I read Ishmael. I've never read it, but I'm familiar with it. That Jared book Diamond, is a beast. Jared it's a Diamond. beast of a, it's a beast of a book to read. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's literally a textbook you're reading, uh, but it is fascinating. And... You know, I read that along with Ishmael, probably right around the same time I read The War of Art mm-hmm. uh, by Stephen Pressfield, which yeah, is an amazing great. book. And that book did something that no book has ever done to me before. I had this moment where I finished reading it, and I was like, you know what? I need to take a week and see if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Yeah. Because I think being a stand-up comedian is the coolest thing you can be in the world. Yeah. Am I doing stand-up comedy because I think it's the coolest thing I could be in the world or because I love it? So because if you love it as much as you say you do, why are you not working? Or why are you not working at the craft? Not like working at it, like work at it. Why are you not trying to become like an elite craftsman of, of this art, right? So either you're willing to do that and dedicate yourself to the craft and show that you truly love this thing, or go find something you love, you idiot. That's fired like, up. You know yeah. what I mean? <clears throat> that you would dedicate mm-hmm. your life to in such a way. Yeah. And so I spent, I ended up only spending about three days thinking about it before I was like, let's get, let's, let's do yeah. it. Let's yeah. dig in, man. And, you know, that and I also read A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle around oh the boy. same time. Oh boy. And so then I had to read The Power of Now after that because I read yeah. New Earth first. But and then you get, you know, then you could start going down all these rabbit holes like, oh, I got to read. What are these other books I haven't read that I need to read that are considered these ancient, these classics, these timeless, you yeah. know, philosophical, you know, like fables? And, and, and yeah. And it's just like, and, oh my God, there's so much out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I wish I like the five agree or the four agreements. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm just like, you know, you read these books, you're like, my life will never be the same, man. Yeah. And then like a couple months later, you read some book and you're like, my life will never be the same. But hopefully, right? And then I think what we were talking about earlier, um, you know, like sometimes I don't even think we realize the effect. And then years later, we were like, oh, I'm like, it's like, why am I reading right. all of this? I can't, can mm-hmm. I keep track of all of this stuff? Like right now, I'm listening to UFO Experience by mm-hmm. Jalen Hynek. I'm reading mm-hmm. a different book. And then it's just like, okay, like um, trying to keep track of it all, right? And then it's like, okay, I can remember now, five years ago, some of the things I was reading, I'm like, oh, I am fundamentally different in the way I view the world now. 100%. And I didn't realize it in, the, in real time, right? Nope. And I'm not supposed to. Mm-mm. I'm just supposed to absorb, adapt, <clears throat> and evolve. Hopefully, you can't keep score. Well, you know, yeah. right? You just got to let it happen. I said, I said at one time again to another uh, a patient. I said, "Look, I have a question because the guy was just super sharp at like 90 years old." And I said, "Look, at at like 25, I thought, man, at 20, I really thought I knew things, and at 25, I realized I was an idiot. And then I got to 30, and I looked at 25, and I realized I was an idiot. And I got to 35, and looked at 30, and I said, when is that going to stop?'" Because it's freaking me out. I I, I'm, I want to stop thinking that I've got a good beat on things. And then five years later, I realize I wasn't that intelligent. And the guy was like, no, no, that's a good thing. Yeah. He goes, that means you're always learning. You're always the people that never have those realizations. Those are the ones that you got to watch out for. That think at 25, they've got it all figured out forever. 
He's like, you're learning. That's why yeah. you have these moments of, of resetting every five, ten years, whatever. Yeah, I mean, but I it's unsettling because you're like perfectly God, sad. Isn't that I thought just I was a, so smart at 25. Yeah, no. I mean, that's the ultimate journey of the soul is to come down here and experience all of these things, right? In this physical form. Okay, well, let me ask you this. I know it's your show. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I having too much fun? The uh, I think the enjoyment's all on the side yeah, of the yeah, yeah. table. So, running. talking about coming down here to experience, right? Um, and I've had like the gamut, I guess. I suppose, and there's so much more I hope to experience, and so much more I hope to learn, and etc. Right. But there are certain experiences that I still. I desperately want to have, right? So I'm curious, when it comes to, like, the Holy Grail experience, the thing that will, even though you're believing already and a believer, like, I, I, I think it's safe to say that we're woo-woo wild ones is what I call us. You know, we're true believers. Yeah. Um, and so what's that one experience that even being a woo-woo wild one would still fundamentally change you and deepen your belief in a way that you couldn't anticipate? I think it would be, you know, seeing one of those portals open up and that you hear about, you know, or seeing a close encounter of any kind, you know, whether it be a ship or a being or, you know, some kind of disturbance in, um, you know, doppelgangers. We love to talk about doppelgangers. I was about to say, is this an experience uh, we've had or that if we had it? That no, was one you haven't had yet that haven't you want had yet. to have. If we had this experience, it would... It would, ra it would like, it would be transformational, even though you already believe it to probably be a thing that's true. Right, but I get having I see, what you, I yep. see what you're saying. But yeah, now. but having totally. it would just still, wow, just to actually can get the mine's I all see extraterrestrial related. I yeah, know it would that. be something the, like the that. Spirits, it would be like the, that's what you'd really want if you could pick stuff? one thing that like you get to have. Do you want to get to experience? Do you want to know how funny this is? This is the, you. Just, so you're comedian you like this. So I obviously am into the woo. I'm into the ufology. I'm into this and that. My wife maybe not so much, but. I said, here's the joke. We're That's at home. Swoop. The beam of light beams down. I'm like, yes, they're here. You know, and I go running down and they're like, we're here for her. And I'm like, figures. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Get on. Just go. See, Don't even say goodbye. Just go. Oh. So you'd want to get you'd want to get taken. Yes. Well, Bob would jump in the portal. We have a, a good buddy. I'm Joel, ready to go. Joel Thomas from Kill the Mockingbird. I've Birds weighed podcast. all the options like Matthew McConaughey and Interstellar. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'll see debates. you again in the future. Would you get on the ship and go for a ride, Already or gone. would you jump in the portal? Portal opens up. Which one would you do? Would you get on the ship? Ah, portal. Not knowing where the portal's going to go as well. You have no clue. Our buddy Joel Thomas from Kill the Mockingbird is like, I'm <laughs> jumping in that portal. I don't care. Me? I'm not getting in that portal. I'm I would take a ship. ride on the ship. Get on the ship. The portal's too much, dude. Yeah. Well, I've let me ask you, is, your, is, is he married? Uh, no. I, is he? He's not, I, okay. mean, I think the portal answer is for someone who might have less holding him here. Yeah. Or holding them here, I should say. Now, fair point. Fair um, point. Maybe. But also, there's people who are just so curious that it trumps everything else, right? That's and Joel. They just don't think that they're not going to come back, maybe. Yeah. Because they're not even thinking, like, I have to take this opportunity. Yeah. Now, I will say that. It wasn't. It was earlier this year. I was in Mount Shasta with my buddy Eric uh, Connor. Here we go. I've never been, but I gotta get out there. Now, legendary, here the heart go. chakra of the world. The Lemurians yeah. live inside the mountain. I've never been there when it's warm enough to get deep into the mountain to look for the hidden door. Oh my goodness! But uh, you know, energy vortexes, etc. Everything you could ever want. I've been to Mount Shasta a couple times now. This place, I love this place so deeply. When you're there, you feel different. There's something happening there, right? And Black Butte's right there, mm -hmm. which I totally forgot about, you know, if anybody's familiar with Project Serpo, things like that. But so uh, we're there, and my buddy Eric and I are continuing an investigation, the investigation we started at Post Town, because we use C5 protocols, a variation of them, to try to contact the ghosts or spirits or whatever is in Post Town. It pulls 
me outside, pulls us outside. We got bonkers things happening. I go back with Matthew Jackson. Matthew and I, just me and him in the school one night, I think it was about a year ago. It was very cold. And we, and I think after reviewing a bunch of footage from previously, from like a year before or whatever, and then bringing up star maps on the dates, you know, the date and the time, how you can see exactly where the stars were right. because of a star that I believe we were communicating with something that was located on a certain star. And it was a one star in the sky this Dude. particular night oh. where we were brought outside. Eric was using an ITC device with our buddy Jim Perry from the Euphemed podcast, which is a brilliant, it's like an NPR, like paranoid, it's a really great show. They're up there listening to this device Eric has built and created called the Gateway device. Whoa. My buddy Alex Mastretta and I are outside. Alex was uh, in charge of UPARS, which is UFO Paranormal Research Society of LA. They used to be MUFON LA. They broke off from MUFON and became UPARS. He was the lead investigator for MUFON LA. He was on Star Team at one point, which was the Robert Bigelow funded first action response team to UFO sightings, wow. which was very short lived. Wow. Anyway, so. Wow. Damn. Anyway, so Bigelow. we're, so oh, we're outside. Holy so cow. I got Alex there who's not afraid of anything. Um, and so we got a, like a great team, right? And I'm just me. Like, hey, man, <laughs> all stoked. these guys are great. And I'm like, okay, man, let's see. You're right. And so I've got a laser pointer, and I'm like, because we hear east, east, east through the gateway device. And I'm like, we're going outside. And I didn't want to go outside because a year earlier I had a um, – or a couple years earlier I had such a terrifying experience on a paranormal investigation in Florida that I'll tell you about if we have time. Sure. That sure. it made me – I have never camped. I have not still to this day camped anywhere outside in a tent. Uh, I slept with the lights on in my room for We're gonna, over a we'll year. We'll talk about that, yeah. Um, I started seeing a therapist, a PTSD therapist because of it. I tell people, I'm like, you know, I, I needed a therapist be for before this, but it took Bigfoot to get me through the door. But like, so <laughs> anyway, so... I'm thinking of the therapist <laughs> who shows like the Bigfoot branded right this way. <laughs> oh. anyway, so, <laughs> what a giant couch that would be. Yeah. And it's like, so, and I had just like maybe four days prior to this, went back for the very first time to the Florida location to confront my fear mm. under the work I'd been doing for two years with my therapist. Uh, he's like, you have to go back. You have to go back to this place. And I'm like, I know I do, because that's the thing I hate about myself. That like if I'm if I'm truly scared of something, I just know that I have to do it. That's why I did DMT because I was terrified of it, um, <laughs> or the idea of it. Right. So, uh, and I spent the night there. Everything was okay. So I came back. I confronted that fear, and now we get pulled outside, and I'm like, I don't want to be outside, man, at night. You know, and there's one star. I've got a laser pointer. I'm like, it's 90 degrees almost exactly on my compass east. The only star we can see in the sky on a cloudy night. I start zapping it with my illegal, probably, laser pointer. Because, which, <laughs> uh, big green ones? You're not allowed to use these. Right? Yeah, you don't want the big green ones. I know what you're so I'm just about. like, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. So I start, and we've got uh, walkie talkies. And so I'm like, I'm like, okay, we're out here. I'm going to laser pointer the, and I go, I'm going to laser pointer the star, and I laser it, and then Eric goes, it just said east. And so I was like, I'm going to do it again. Did it. It just said east. So it's like, it's not a it's star. It's like responding to or whatever, right? So, and I'm just like, what is happening? So wow. cut to, I find out what I think what star it is months later. I'm going through the footage and all this other stuff. So we go back, and I'm like, it's the Procyon star. Something from Procyon is communicating with us. So me and Matthew Jackson, with all of his <laughs> with his trunk of ITC oh devices, God, he's like the mad he's like the mad king of ITC dude, devices, man. right? He's like the king of ITC. So he's got all these brilliant, he's got like an original Frank's box there. Yeah. And yeah all kinds of yeah. So we've got and so we, we set up like, we set up three different devices in this room in Post Town where it all initially had popped off like a year and a half or a year previous when I filmed the special and we did the investigation. And I'm like, I have specific questions. I think I know who we're talking to. This isn't going to, we're going to just get right to it, right? So I'm like, 
and at the time, I think I had just read uh, Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts and some other things. And uh, there's also this Alice, uh, this Crowley book or, or the Book of the Dead or the Book of Law. The Book of the Law. The Book of the Law. Yeah. And because there's this one, I forget what it is, the Eighth Dimension that they talk about. This uh, Krenos. The there's being. this big, p- powerful woman uh, being in one of these dimensions that to me is they're describing DMT woman. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. anyway, so, yeah. so Shane so, Moss's so, purple gypsy lady. Yes. So I'm making yeah. all these connections between all these different things, right? Um, and so I'm like, okay. And I was like, man, too bad it's not serious, but you know, because all that ties into serious. And I'm like, ah, it's too bad, you know, but it's Procyon, which is like, I think the third brightest star. And I'm like, oh, Procyon's still a pretty badass star. So <laughs> let's give some props to Procyon here. So uh, we get all the devices set up. And we're filming, and I'm like, okay, we're talking to Procyon. So thank you. We do the CE5 protocols, a variation of them. And we go through all that for about 15 minutes, and we start talking. And I'm talking to Procyon, and Procyon is not answering. <laughs> and I'm I'm almost crestfallen, <laughs> right? Like, but Procyon, man, I thought we had such a good thing going. You right. know what I mean? And so then I'm like, so after a while, I'm just like, are we talking to, are we talking to someone from Sirius? And all the devices just go, they all Whoa. pop off. And so me and Matthew are like, what, what? And so I'm like, so we're talking to someone from Sirius? And these, de- you know, like REM pods, these EMF meters, these things go off, but they don't go off for 15 seconds straight. Together. Or, you know, for like at high levels. Yeah. Like that's You know just, when the slot machines hit. Right, yeah. Right. So, I mean, in a paranormal investigation, typically, whether or not, I don't, you know, people watching, if they've ever done them, they know this, but, um, but people who watch them only on TV, maybe not know it, but like, you know, these really exciting moments and investigations happen that last maybe 10 seconds. That's like the entirety sometimes. Right. And they're really powerful and profound, but this was just going bonkers for minutes. Wow. So then later we go to a different room with a different device. And there's all these voices coming through, one of these different devices that Matthew has. And one of them is very deep. Like, but it's like backwards, right? And so no forward words are supposed to be happening. And there's all these other different voices like popping in. So then I'm just like, can we just talk to the... The deep, ve- the deep voice guy. Who's please. in charge? I was like, yeah, can we I was, get deep voice I was like, guy? Can we just talk? Everybody shut up. I just want to talk to the deep voice guy. Right? So basically it was that, but in a much less like comedic way. And so I go, can I please, can we please have all the other voices stop? We only want to talk to this guy because he seems to be, He's there's something a, about him. Yeah. That was like, almost. he had information. He's got a message. Yeah. Something about this voice. Matthew and I were both like, we should be, Talking to him. Yeah, he means business. So, or it, or whatever. Yeah, fair enough. And so then I go, and then all the voices kind of stop. And then I ask, or we ask, like, who are you? And the deep voice comes through and says, God. And then we're like, we look at each other, we're like, you heard God? I heard God. You heard God? Okay, we heard God. Okay. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, thank you. Uh, well, what's your name? And then we hear, Raw. Oh my God. And we're like, you heard raw. You heard raw contact. And now we're like, raw, you heard raw. And so we're wow. like, oh. And so I'm like, so uh, thank you, raw. Thank you. Thank you. Where are you from? And then we hear the cosmos. Wow. And this was moments, like not moments, but like right after we were in the other room communicating with what we, I believe to be an entity and intelligence from the Sirius star system. Now, cut to. Damn. Me having this realization of I don't need to be at Post Town for this investigation to continue anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a line of communication established. Now, we can go anywhere. And I'm like, where do I want to go? Mount Shasta. Right. Or Joshua Tree. Yeah. Oh. We go to Mount Shasta. Joshua Tree. This past May, me and my buddy Eric Connor. And we are out in the mountain in deep, deep snow. So we can only go so far. We find Eric notices a large circle of trees, right? And we've got his gateway device. We also have a spirit box and a couple other little things. Not much because we had to hike in mm-hmm. through like five feet of snow into the mountain. So we get there. We find this, you know, circle of trees. 
we make a symbol before we enter in what looks like an entrance. And this is after Eric, uh, I think the day before, uh, we were doing visualization exercises, like when we were out on, an invest- on the investigation, and he saw the Trinity symbol. Mm. And then later that night, the day before, so the previous night, we went to this park, this like locals only area that a friend of ours, a local guide, a friend of mine, kind of showed us like, hey, you know, people don't really, people who come to Mount Chester don't really know about this area. We go there, we see the Trinity sign on the sidewalk. Mm. Somebody had painted after Eric earlier in the day on the mountain saw the Trinity sign in his mind. So I'm like, we, That's we see that and we're like, we are on the right track. And then we say, because we, we the had that conversation. Yeah. And the whole, the whole reason I'm on this whole tangent right now is because we were talking about would we get on the ship. I right. love it. Earlier that day. It, yeah. Continue, sir. And we're like, we will get on that ship. So yeah. we've got a device going. And then we're like, okay, we're here. Is this where we're going to see you? You are going to, because we're convinced you, that whatever it is, is going to be presenting themselves to us in a physical form. And so we're like, Jeez. and so we're like, we, and so we say, we are ready right now. And then we hear through the box, the device, are you? But it wasn't, it could have been interpreted a couple of different ways. It could have been like, are you? Like, oh, you are? Or it could have been like, huh, are you? Like, oh, really? like almost threatening. Make Somebody's my day. got doubt. It got to the point where we're like, <laughs> Okay, maybe we're not. <laughs> right. Like we were like, we both were just like, the way it sounded and the way it came out, we we're just like, okay, maybe we're not as ready as we right. thought. Uh, let's let's take a breath. Let's dial cut it to, back a little. So cut to the next day. Damn. We're back on the mountain. We find this perfect circle of trees. And you can see up to the sky. It's pure, no deer, nothing has walked through. There's no tracks. We make a symbol, like a, like an offering kind of symbol before we enter. We get in there, Eric has his spirit box, and we're just getting nothing. And this is after, like, bonkers communication had been happening for, like, two days. And so I'm just like, what is that? And the spirit box is playing backwards. It's reverse audioed. Uh, so it's scanning very fast. And I just go, I, I feel like we had such a... I felt like our, communi- our, our conversation was going to go to the next step. After Post Town, like, I, we know who we're talking to. Like, what happened? I feel like, I feel like something happened. Something, something's wrong. Hmm. Why can't we communicate? As soon as I say that, Eric's spirit box stops on the song Space Oddity by David Bowie. Wow. And nice. it's playing it what? forward. This is ground that's control wow. to major time. But that's a problem already, right? Because it's going in reverse, right? Right. Spirit boxes. So his spirit box, the only time it's ever happened, stops and plays Space Oddity by David Bowie, which is a song about how there's a breakdown in communication between someone in space and someone on Earth and how wow. they can't get a hold of one another. Right after I say something along the lines of, what happened? I thought we were communicating. There's seems to be a breakdown wow. in our communication. It plays the whole song. <laughs> what? Eric and I are now dancing. Dude, that's a great this, tune, dude. We're dancing in the snow on Mount Shasta with just me and him and my oh buddy gosh. Alex, who's a cameraman there, um, filming it. Having the most gleeful experience of my entire life, practically. Oh, that's awesome. The song ends... Spirit box just goes back to what? and it is like now is that evidence of communication with an extraterrestrial intelligence or some kind of other intelligence to someone who's skeptical wow. and highly scientifically minded? No, but is it evidence that we're in communication with something that is highly intelligent and was communicating to us? Wow, one hundred percent. In my opinion, it was. Wow, would it hold up in a court of law? No. Right. But it's like, this Amazing. is why we do it, right? But right. I think this right. goes back to your whole, like, you've got to, it's one of those, like, uh, I say it anymore to myself, is like, I have to be there to experience it myself. Like, not saying I'm discounting your experience. Um, it's more of, like, um, 
if you have that, then you have that actual. It's tough to convey to like experiencing is believing. Hundred percent. Yeah, but I, I've had enough referential or tangential experiences or, or you know, associative that on my own that I'm like I'm kind of good already. It's just I'm very comfortable in saying I don't know. You know, when other people like, oh, well, this is how I think everything works out, or this is how everything shakes out. I, that's great. I'm glad you think think you know. I don't know. I'm open to a lot of possibilities. And and being uh, just open to those more or less is like giving me the ability to go, yeah, I can kind of get behind that. Yeah. Certain things, not so much. But again, just because I haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not real. But there's a lot of people that don't really know how to give that breadth in between of where they go, yeah, sure, great for you, but I haven't had that. Maybe someday. It's just more of... It ebbs and flows. Belief ebbs and flows for me. I mean, I could go... I mean, I have friends who are psychics and, you know, do tarot readings or they channel or what or mediums. And yet I went to... I, there's a shamanic Reiki healer I go see. She's deeply psychic, very powerful. Uh, it's a very healing experience. It's, it's amazing. Um... Like when she's doing her Reiki, it's that same feeling like right before the mushrooms hit. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like something is changing in my body, right? And, but then she'll be like, you need to open up to this. She has to remind, like to, to most of my like comedy friends, especially not maybe my paranormal crew, but to, definitely to my comedy friends, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like a maniac, right? And so in my shamanic Reiki healer who I'm paying money to go see still has to remind me to be like, open up to this. See, Stop being like but you know closed off to the experience. You know what I mean? Right. It's because we're paying taxes and we're, you know, following traffic lights and yeah. we're, we're doing all this monkey business we put ourselves into. This, this diorama we created, right? Like what we force ourselves to live through so that we have, we have to let go of that. To remind ourselves that we know there's a separation of the two, but like we said earlier, I think too, like, yeah, there might be UFOs, but I still gotta somehow eat a sandwich or That's go to the bathroom crazy. or you know make my bed or whatever it is. Like, yeah, this might be happening, but I still have to do this and this and this, right? Yeah. I mean, we still have to be people. Too. Yes, uh, even though we might not be people at all. <laughs> yeah, <Damn>. that's. <laughs> I mean, that's just like. I don't know. I, you can you can say that about anything, or you could say it about nothing at all. You, you, you it's know. true, hundred um, percent. But yeah, so I mean, I don't know what's the uh, the chat's on the fire. Chat's by been the going way. off since <laughs> since we started. Right? Uh, Euphemet is a great podcast. Uh, <laughs> Euphemet from Sess. Uh, yep. Sessions. I think. Uh, yeah. So I don't know how much longer or what else we, we got. To get we into. Got, yeah, we got plenty of um, time. Shout out that UFO chick. I know Cryptids of the Corn's in here. Victor, what's happening? Sess in the city. Sorry that we haven't All been... you guys are in here holding it down. Burton, I saw a bunch of super chats it, like, and stickers. Thank you, brother. We appreciate it. There was a it. question earlier I know Burton had about the, uh, Maybe the pregnant. Uh, we might get to that. but uh, Okay. Well, you're, yeah, you're if pregnant. we know that one, I'll, I, yeah, I'll answer it if I can. <laughs> Stunner might have to scrabble back through the yeah. scroll of the chat so we can figure um, out what the questions were. But I believe it was... I saw them pop up over here. Yeah, yeah there we go. Okay. I want to know. Oh, that was the baby. That was to the <laughs> shapeshifter. Oh, okay. If she had the baby. But they were asleep, right? The belly went away when you woke up. That's what, oh, wait, yeah, what would have What would have happened if she had the baby? Yeah. Right. Oh, and um, Sess in the City had a question, too. Or had a comment. Riveting. Two of my, two of my favorite, favorite podcasts. Oh, the wow. Studio. I didn't see oh, that one. Nice. Thank you so much. Sess in the City <clears throat> is a listener. She must be listening there already. Oh. Oh, thank shoot. you, thank you, thank awesome. you. She thank was you. one of our uh, uh, Rockin' the Strange Road tees in the uh, promo pics that we put up at the start of the episode. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the when UFO I first check. saw the screen name, I thought it was CE5 in the city. Hey, <laughs> I'll tell you what. That's not a bad name, too. Yeah, CE5. <laughs> um, Maybe. Now, if that baby would have been born, or if we would have had to go to the hospital for that dude, baby, dude. I honestly can't tell you what... I, what would have happened? I mean, it would have been, she would have had no prenatal care records. She would have had no, <laughs> there would have been, Jesus Christ. <laughs> wait, wait. 
<laughs> Basically, what I'm saying, there'd be no record of her being pregnant. <laughs> oh. Well, Burton said, would it would have been born what, yeah. and just disappeared? Oh, I'm thinking about like all yeah. the baby being taken by the government or something. But right. um, no, the, that would have uh, been in X Files. Yeah, Scully uh, and Mulder would have showed up. Would the baby? I'll tell you if if that baby would have been born and like lived. Who? I have no idea what I would be living off grid probably somewhere. Right. Raising a a super a Superman. Right. Uh, it's it's some, <laughs> like I don't I would be like the boys. You know, yeah. It's I, like, yeah. I probably would be. I have no idea. I, I can't even begin to imagine. Yeah, I'm still gonna have to go back and listen to that episode because I'm still so curious as the the <sighs> her story of just her story is fascinating and it's, and it's heartbreaking. Oh, and that's so it's, sad. You know, I try to find hope in her story. I, I we're no longer in communication with one another, sadly. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't have updates for people, and I, you yeah. know, there's very little updates I could give anyway. But you find that so often in the world of the paranormal, there's the heartbreaking yet the hopeful simultaneously. I think. Yeah. You know, um, UFO of God, which is the book about Chris Bledsoe, his experience with oh, yeah. orbs and things like that. Bledsoe mm-hmm. said I think, so. Yeah. I think that is a perfect example of a gut-wrenchingly heartbreaking story that has the hope of the human spirit imbued throughout the entire story. Yeah. Whether it's Chris or his his kids, Ryan and, you know, Chris or Jr. Like Stardust and, Ranch or any of those kinds yeah, of so, stories. Yeah, so, and it's, it's one of those things where I've been hyper-fascinated for years about extended periods of hardship truly show character, um, when things are going great for someone, it's easy to be a good person. When things mm-hmm. are when things are difficult, you really see what a person is made of, right? This is this belief that I, for some reason, hooked on to that belief, mm. even though it was just something I was told, right? But I chose to believe it. And, and for some reason, I find it kind of loosely associated with, like, Dr. Philip Zombardo's work and the Stanford Prison Experiments and things like that. Like, I, I don't exactly know the, the true connection there, but it's about, like, you know, we are part of us—we are just organisms inside of a system, and the system has an effect on all of us, whether we realize it or not. Mm-hmm. And it's a very powerful effect, and we have, to, we have to try to be mindful of that. And the paranormal community is a system— Oh, yeah. And what effects uh, does the paranormal system have on us as people who are involved in it and people who are believers and, Mm -hmm. you know, people who want to believe and we want more belief to happen. And so, you know, and it's, you know, oftentimes these are, you know, maybe they could be considered superfluous conversations or thoughts to be having or exercises of the mind, but it's something important that every once in a while we can get reminded to take a step back and think about, okay, well, what's really important here? And what's really important is the human experience. And I think we're talking about Euphemet earlier. I think Jim Perry does such a great job about, you know, prioritizing the human experience when it comes to uh, interactions with, you know, whether it's SPEs or, you know, sightings or whatever it is, or experience with psychokinetic abilities. It's what is the human experience through all of this? Bingo. I talk about that. I mean, we had a DMT researcher on, Zeus Tapato. He's he's uh, doing research in, in the Netherlands, and, and we talked about that too. And he, he's had his own trips and different things, but it's like whether it's paranormal or psychedelic, that experience affected you in some way. Maybe you took that experience and changed your life completely. Was that experience real? Real in the sense of what? Real in the sense that it affected you so profoundly and shook you to the core that you went and created something like this or created your show or decided I'm going to go do stand-up for the first time and go to open mic or, or whatever it is. And so is it real? Maybe not. Maybe it wasn't real, but it affected you. To you, it was Mm -hmm. absolutely real. And that's the tough part with experiences. I'm having such an intense deja vu right now. Um, Deja vu? Which rarely happens for me. I had deja vu twice today now. Whoa. I don't remember the last time I've had deja vu twice. It's the beaver moon, bro. It is the beaver moon. (laughs) Bro. So I do want to say this, though. Like, I love this idea, you know, of what you're talking about. Yeah. And it is... The question I like to ask myself is, like, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? Like, what's the point? Like, if I'm not 
This was 7.30 in the morning every day for me. Right? It's like, but it's like to the point of like, like with the spirit of like, well, what am I even doing here? Like if I'm not trying to experience, if I'm not trying to love, if I'm not allowing myself some grace and making a mistake right, from time to time, I've made so many mistakes, it's bonkers. Yeah. Uh, we have to have some grace with ourselves in, regarding that. But like, it's like, what are we even doing here? It's like, why? I, I, I wasn't born onto this planet to... To have to go to school to study something that didn't interest me to have a job that I I disliked to save a bunch a bunch of money so I could maybe enjoy the last five good years of my life before my mind goes. So I like it's like what are that's, we doing? That's hitting home. What to are a we lot doing of people here? right now? Yeah, right. And I think COVID, <clears throat> the lockdown, rattled a lot of cages in regard to that. Oh and yeah, a lot of people abandoned the past. Yes, and embarked on a brave new future that mm-hmm. was scary as hell. And I love that. Three quarter of our guests are those people. Three yeah. quarter of our guests, whether it's Josh Smart, Incredible History, um, you know, a lot of the people that we've, they all kind of had normal jobs and had this, and then just COVID, they had free time. I'm going to pursue my passions. I'm going to go into this world, yeah. and now here they are, three years later, killing it on TikTok. They got a great Instagram page. Well, Maybe and they started made, a YouTube channel. It made people like think about what they were doing for the first time in a long time. Yep. And they were at home to be able or to think about it. Or you went backwards, yeah. and now you're more mentally ill and paranoid Possibly. and freaked out because you're watching the COVID numbers tick away on your screen Possibly. at home, locked down. Those people didn't do well. The people no. that were tuned into mainstream media getting, you know, so it's like... It felt like a hunger Some games people moment. were able to shift and do much, much better and pivot. And some people kind of got stuck even deeper into the matrix because I like to say the year before COVID was Jeffrey Epstein. That kicked the freaking door wide open for everyday normal people that had no clue about what a conspiracy or a conspiracy theory even was. Now, everybody in America had Epstein didn't kill himself memes on their Facebook pages. I said we woke up way too many people that kicked the door down so many people woke up and then covid was like an opportunity to put all those people that woke up back into their hole in a way to me because there was a lot of people that were talking about these kind of subjects with during the epstein time in 2019 and so you felt this a lot of people opening and then kind of got closed back down the very next year and i think an interesting part about this conversation that I've never really had before is, and you hear it a lot with ayahuasca or especially DMT, mm-hmm. and that's integration Yeah. after the fact. Okay, so you had this experience. Now, how do you integrate in a healthy yeah. way? And I actually have a, a cousin of mine who co-authored a book about this, specifically with ayahuasca, but um, it's been more than a few years since I read it, so I, I can't believe I'm forgetting my family, <laughs> my family's book, but uh, family member's book. But, and I think paranormal integration is difficult because there's not really an official system for it, right? And I know a dear friend of mine who's no longer alive, Claudia Ackley, who was uh, kind of well-known in the Bigfoot community. She had, she had some pretty intense experiences and she was very active in trying to have uh, traumatic support groups. Mm. Um, specifically with Bigfoot encounters, which can be terrifying. Yeah. Oh, I believe it. And so she was very active in trying to get, to push that forward and remove a stigma of mental health, you know, shining a light on the mental health aspect of you, how crazy you can feel or how tra- traumatized you can, you can be from a certain experience. And, and that's, you know, the integra- how do we integrate these experiences? When I went and saw my therapist for the very first time, and I don't know if we have time to talk about this story. but We do, yeah. Um, You've got as much time as you want. The, in 2019, my buddy, Ed Brown, who's a Bigfoot guy, uh, he – actually, I met him and Claudia together. They were together. When I initially met them at an UPARS meeting, and because I was going to – 
my buddy Alex Mastretta, who I mentioned earlier, he was uh, the the Upars and the Mufon LA guy. He arranged for us to meet. A, he brought them in to come see. They were living in Lake Arrowhead, California at the time. They came in to see a, uh, Upar's uh, speaker. I forget who it was. And I was going to interview her for the podcast, for my podcast. So Alex set it all up. I met him. It was great. Ed and I happened to be from almost he, from the same hometown area. He kind of grew up in Middletown, Ohio. We hit it off. We do fantasy football together, all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyway, he calls me one night. He goes, what? He's like, do you want to be part of an investigation team that gets to go to the uh, Skinwalker Ranch of the uh, South? Oh. And I go, uh, yeah. Of course I do. <laughs> and he goes, okay, you'll be my paranormal guy. I'm gonna have, we're going to have a paranormal person. We're going to have a UFO person. We're going to have a Bigfoot person. It's gonna, so it's going to be kind of like a multidisciplinary mm-hmm. disciplinary? Yep, multidisciplinary yeah. team. And I was like, I'd, I'd love it. I'd love it. And I've heard stories of this place. It was on the very first episode of Finding Bigfoot, this location. And so uh, I'm so excited. I'm so jacked. So we get down there. We're going to spend well, six days, five nights. And I get there and I meet uh, Bill and Carolyn who live there. It's like, you know, 30 acres, middle of nowhere in Florida. And on a house he built, he's an architect for the state of Florida. Oh, She's cool. retired from disability. Um, she has insane psychokinetic abilities. Uh, along the lines of, I would say, Ted Owens from PK Man, written by Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, if people are familiar with that story. Um, so... Anyway, there's all kinds of stuff happening. There's apparently two portals on the property. There's UFOs, there's orbs, there's creatures, Bigfoot, other creatures, unknown, what they be called. And there's also spirit activity, ghost activity that they've, they've captured just on recorders themselves at home. And so this is going to be bonkers. This is going to be wild. We've got, you know, a team down there. We got security guards with us because they that was part of the agreement for us to be there. That we had to have armed guards with us the whole time because they didn't want anybody anything happening. To, so I was like, "This is that's interesting. That's are we overdoing that's it? That's really bizarre." Right? And so we have, uh, you know, we get a sighting of a creature on uh, a thermal camera, a thermal scope. That this guy who was part of the security team, but he's also a Bigfoot guy. He was former game warden in the state of California, so he knows how to track animals, all this kind of stuff. Mm. He captured this creature on his thermal scope. Uh, it's pretty terrifying to look at the image, an artist rendition of what you're actually looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just all running towards this creature. And and I'm just like, I guess this is what we do. <laughs> right, so... Because you know, at this time, I didn't have a ton of woods experience. It was a lot of haunted house stuff for me, right? Um, and so I'm just following them with a the camcorder, running. You can't see anything You're where you're running. And it's just, you know, these Bigfoot people, they're the, they're the wildest. Like, they hear anything. And they're like, run towards the noise that scared the hell out of you. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm like, this is the opposite of the survival instinct. Do you understand? Right. And so... Anyway, we're having a good time during this investigation. I'm getting to know, you know, Bill and Carolyn. They're the best people you've ever met in your life. Uh, we're having a really good time. I'm not sleeping much because it's terrifying to be there. And so we're sleep- I'm sleeping with Ed in this little shack called the Sugar Shack, and it's tiny. We had a digital recorder each night on the windowsill on the inside and a really old window unit AC that was really loud, right, um, as we slept because it was summertime in Florida. And we listened to the recording later from that digital recorder, one night when he and I are both asleep, you, I hear the, it's the loudest wood knocks I've ever heard. Whoa. From right outside <clears throat> the sugar shack. It's terrifying to listen to it just because I know I was there right next to the recorder sleeping when it was all happening, right? So anyway, we got a, a really big footprint cast. We found a nest. We, all kinds of crazy stuff. Unlike the fourth, I wanted to do a paranormal investigation inside the house. Carolyn was like, I don't, you know, she was kind of like, well, we'll see about that. I don't know. She didn't know me, right? So one day, the fourth day or, or whatever it is, Ed comes up to me. He goes, so I talked to Carolyn, and he already knew her. He goes, Carolyn said she wants you to do a paranormal investigation inside the house. She said she'd be okay with that, but she wants to do it by yourself because she said you have different energy than everybody else. 
And I go, okay. And what she meant was I had crystals in my pocket while everyone else had a gun on their hip, right? That was the, <laughs> yeah, that was the different energy. Dark difference. So, <laughs> Gunpowder versus universal energy. Right? So I go, it's still, it's still light out. I go, uh, the location where we were, I come back to the sugar shack, I get all my stuff, I go up, I do a paranormal investigation inside the house. Um, didn't really, there was a couple times I was pretty creeped out, and I didn't, didn't know if I caught anything or anything, but then later Ed found some, you know, in the footage, some, like, voices, EVPs coming, or not EVPs, or but, you know, the spirit box saying, like, I'm inside you, uh, when it, right after I asked a question about something. Anyway, Bill and Carolyn... Later that night, we're just in the house having a good time talking. Everybody comes from the other location where we caught the creature on thermal. And then Ed and I walk down to the sugar shack uh, at the end of the night, probably after midnight, because Carolyn wants me to sleep in one of the guest rooms because they call it the dream chamber, where people have the craziest dreams of their life in this room. So I'm like, well, let me go get my dream journal, which I got, and my toiletry bag, and I'll be right back. And you're never supposed to be alone on the property at night. That's the rule, one of the rules we had to abide by. Probably a good rule. And so Ed and I walk down to the sugar shack, and we have motion sensor camera on a tree 20 feet away from the front door of the, of the sugar shack. It catches us. It activates as we walk by. We go into the sugar shack five, ten minutes, talking, hanging out, blah, 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 planning the next day. I grab my stuff. I walk out of the sugar shack. Ed closes and locks the door. I get about five or six feet. Up, slightly uphill the sandy Florida driveway through the woods to get back up to the house, which is, you know, maybe not even a five-minute walk, right? Short walk. And I get about five or six feet up the driveway, and then I hear from about 30 feet behind me the most terrifying noise I've ever heard in my entire life, which is a scream, yell, high-pitched, had vibrato, it was uh, directed clearly right at me from directly behind me uh, to the point where I froze and, like, I rattled almost. And we had a password or a code word, avalanche, for the security team. If you ever yell avalanche, that means they need to have their finger on the trigger Damn. because something bad is happening. Uh, and I was told over and over again, we know you're a comedian— you don't joke around with avalanche. Right. Right. <clears throat> and so in that moment, I am about to yell avalanche. And then I realize the security team's back at the hotel. They're gone. I'm alone. And so I can't <laughs> yell avalanche. <laughs> so I start to yell avalanche like, <laughs> like I'm making the noise as I start to make the noise. And then instantly realize don't make the noise because there's no avalanche to be had. And then I start yelling for Ed almost, right? Because I'm like, because Ed's right there and he's slightly closer to this thing than I am. And then I realize as I'm yelling Ed's name right before I get it out, I realize I don't want him coming out of that door because then he'll be closer to whatever this thing is that just let yeah. me know that I am below it on the food chain. So I start Damn, to yell, man. So I start Jesus. to yell avalanche and I start to yell Ed simultaneously Jesus. as I stop myself from yelling either. And then what comes out is what I can only imagine to be the uh, the craziest sounding whimper scream anyone's ever heard in their life. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> just frozen in fear. Oh my god, dude! I start running up the driveway <laughs> as fast as goat I syndrome. can. Just, right? Surprised you ever weren't just completely frozen and you could run. Well, I knew oh, I had you know, to. Yeah. I had no choice. Fly, fight or flight. So I start oh. running up this driveway, and it's got a little bit of winds and curves Damn. to it. And then about three fourths <laughs> up the driveway, I do the bravest thing I've ever done in my life. I turn around to see how close it is to me. I look behind me, and there's nothing. And I just keep running. I get to this gate. It's about waist high. I open the gate. I clo- I, I can't get the gate closed because I have, like, my mom in my brain, like, you know, don't be rude. Close the fucking—close the gate. 
<laughs> and then like I also have like this subconscious thing like don't leave the gate open. You're like saying you know, you're welcome. In. You're yeah. welcome to come in. The gate is open. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm like if the gate's closed, maybe. So I, I I try to finally get this gate closed. I get to the front door. Luckily, it's not locked. I get in. There's this guy David who's part of the research team. He's still in there in the kitchen. I close the door. I lock it. And they have all these things to like double lock. And then they have those sticks that Jesus, prop the door because they've had so many crazy things happen at this house. What? That they have shutters on the inside of their home. What? The inside of the house has the wood. This shutters. is the Skinwalker Ranch of the South. So I get in there and David looks at me and goes, what just happened to you? You look like you saw a ghost. And I start crying and shaking and trembling. And I'm, Damn. Jeez, you know, and then I try to recreate the scream. Carolyn hears me, comes out of her bedroom. She's like, "What's?" She's like, "What's going on out here?" And then she goes, "Oh my God, you you saw it!" And I go, "I didn't see it, but I heard it," and it screamed at me. And then uh, we had two more nights after that at the property. And needless to say, I did not sleep. Um, I could, I just felt like I could hear it walking around outside, even though it probably wasn't there, but I heard it. Um, my Fitbit at the time. I woke up the next day. I eventually fell asleep. You know, it was probably after the sun came up. I let myself fall asleep finally. Slept for maybe three hours. My Fitbit said I burned like 3,000 calories. Oh, yeah. Just because my heart rate was so high. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, Anxiety. I was still pretty shooken up the next day. We went and did a reenactment. I walked him through it. And my buddy, who Dan, who's the uh, tr- former game warden, uh, he's like, make sure nobody walks down there, blah, 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 because I want to look at the footprints and I'm going to see if we can find evidence of where this thing may have been standing in the woods, blah, blah, blah. So he finds my footprints and he goes, this is what I'll, this is what I'll tell you I think happened. You walk out of the sugar shack, you get like five, six, seven steps or whatever. Something gets your attention because you can see you swivel a little bit. Your footprints swivel mm. as if you're looking behind you. And then it looks like you started running because now there's an indent where it shows that your feet got grip into the mm, ground to mm. run. And then he goes, as we walk up the driveway, you can see the space between your footprints, which I would argue you've probably never run faster in your entire life looking at the distance between your steps. Wow. You were moving. Damn, bro. So that was validation. Jesse Owens. Because nobody heard it. Ed didn't hear it. Ed thought he the heard. Scream. Ed thought I was getting into my car and doing the beeper on my car alarm. Mm. That's what he said he heard. He thought I was beep, 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 or whatever. So it was like a high-pitched thing, right? Uh, nobody else heard it. Um, and what's what terrified me the most was if something would have happened to me in that moment, uh, Ed would not have known because I was going back up to the house to sleep. Uh, David probably would have went to bed and just left the door unlocked for me if I took too long. And thought, yeah. oh, he'll be back up. They're probably just down there hanging out. Yeah. They wouldn't have known I was missing until the next day. Right, right. And I would have been long gone. I would have been long gone, taken Damn. away or dead or whatever, right? And, like, all those scenarios terrified me so much. Yeah. And so then... That's part of the trauma. You would have yeah. been like a 411 missing David Pilates I would have been there. in the Pilates book. Yeah. Right. Bro, seriously. Yeah, so I didn't, you know, and so all that Well, and that back me. to your point earlier, sorry, but your whole nobody goes anywhere alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a big polite. Boy, they thing. got a lot. Whenever you of... get separation from the group, yeah, the one... and that was the only time I that's... was ever alone on that property at night by myself. The only time wow. in six days was that moment, and it got me. And what is also very frustrating about the world of the paranormal is certain things we know happen all the time that we just have no control over, and that is malfunctions of technical. Equipment. Oh, sure, yeah. So Ed and I walking down the driveway into the sugar shack, captured by the motion activated trail camera, recorded video. Me walking out of the sugar shack was not picked up for some reason. Hmm. But what was picked up moments later, a weird light darting around on the side wall of the sugar shack just dancing around. And it was baffling at first. And then quickly we realized, oh, I had my notebook and my toiletry bag in one hand, and I had a flashlight in the other. So what you see Mm. is me running up the driveway, and from behind me, the flashlight Mm. light 
hitting the side of the sugar shack, dancing around. Uh, so you see that I'm running. And Why did it not pick me up Yeah. when I walk directly towards this motion-activated camera and then turn to walk up the driveway? And the, where you, you would have seen me then? stopped, turned around and screaming or whatever, right? You would have seen that. It would have caught me on camera doing that. But it didn't catch so weird. my six-foot-tall body yeah. moving around in front of it. It didn't activate it. But a faint light from a flashlight dancing around on the side, which is, you can't even pick up that much, but you can tell it's the side, but it's not like a full side view because the camera's facing the front of the building and it's a slight angle, mm-hmm. so you can kind of see it. Yeah. It picks the slightest movement from a flashlight up that yeah, makes it activate. But me no walking and then running and screaming in front of it, it's so it pisses me off so bad. <laughs> well, this sounds like a Bruce Maccabee type thing from the four on one thing where he's like there his wife's camera took a picture that's incapable of being taken on that camera. Like whatever happened when she took that photo is irreplicable. You can't do it again. Like the format of it. So what you're saying is how did it pick that up? That f- yeah, influence it's, it's, of the phenomena, whatever's yeah. doing it or has a friend of mine, dominion over that. So a friend of mine speculated that there was a uh, I jumped timeline so I didn't die. And you um, weren't there in something. front of the camera. Damn. Uh, I, I I don't know if that's, you know, I'm not ready to be like, so I think I jumped, you know, I'm not ready but to no. go into that one. But the, it, it's, it's aggravating, it's frustrating. And then when I get all the footage from my friend Ed, now yes. all the trail cam footage is gone. And I'm just like, where did it go? Why is it gone? I wanted to see the flashlight. I wanted to see us what walking hap- down. What happened? I have no idea where it is. And it's unable for me to find it at this point. God. And it is, and I've seen it because Ed has shown it to me. Ed showed it at a new PARS meeting, um, I don't know, about eight months after the expedition. And then he lost He gives it? a talk. No, it's supposed to be on this hard drive he gave me. Oh, and so, but the fold, the trail cam footage folder is now empty. But he gives a talk at UPARS about this event. And I and he's like, I'm going to feature some of your evidence in this talk. And I was like, okay. I came. I still was sleeping with my lights on at this point um, in my room in L.A. Jeez, in your he, room in he L.A. He starts getting into all this evidence he found. Because I gave him all the footage because it was kind of his thing, right? So yeah. I, and then he starts presenting. And when he said, I'm going to feature a little bit, I didn't realize how much evidence I, I had accumulated. And then he starts talking about my experience and then showing the footage of the footprints. And, and I am, like, ready to break down in the audience. Damn. I'm ready to just start sobbing because I am so upset by seeing it all presented in a way that I wasn't ready for Mm-hmm. Sure, realizing. sure, sure. Yeah. And yeah. So that's when I knew I'm like, this is this is a problem. And so it probably wasn't eight months. It was probably much sooner. But and that's when I was like, I need I need help. Yeah. I'm not capable of just soldiering through this one or whatever. So I went and saw this therapist. I found a PTSD therapist. And I get there, he goes, So why are you here? And I go, <laughs> I, go, I go well there's not to laugh at your yeah but, but i'm oh, like there's geez. like i go there's about three or four things i really want to focus on here i'll tell you the first few and i'll save the last one for later <laughs> after we get to know each other a little bit and he goes okay fair enough and so then i got along with this guy so well immediately by the second week i told him i go i do a lot of paranormal investigations and um, I've had paranormal experiences in my life. I know I'm not a crazy person. Um, I'm not interested in you uh, believing me, but I just had one recently that has totally ruined my life. And Damn. I need to, I can't, I, I wanted to have a mountain. My dream was to have a mountain house. I had, no way. Not anymore. Oh, no, I don't want a mountain house. Right. Um, I could. The only thing I could fantasize was living in like the penthouse of a New York City high rise. After this, for the longest time, being surrounded by people twenty four hours a day, moving around, doing things, someone always awake around me. Wow. Um, I'm starting to get better. I still haven't camped. I used to camp out by myself in between gigs on the road. I would just go to a state park and camp out for a night or two if I had two days off in between cities. I had to perform at. 
I haven't camped with friends even since then. That was 2019, so four years ago. Still haven't camped. Wow. Um, my ex girlfriend always wanted to go to like state park or like national parks and go backpacking, and um, it was really disappointing because I'm I I would just have to tell her I'm like I know this is a big thing that you need in your life and I can't do it. I am not going to Mount Zion and camping on the side of a mountain right now. I'm like, I'm like nothing seems worse to me. Uh, but you went out to Mount Shasta. Was that after this experience? Or stayed that in was Airbnb all be- out there. Right, right. But yeah, this but was... you were out there doing things in Mount Shasta that wasn't like super remote or you were comfortable enough. No, we were pretty remote. I mean, now, granted... But by the way, uh, Matthew, your boy... Matthew Paraholics, Paraholics is in the chat. Oh, yeah. What's up, Matthew? Uh, we were just talking about you earlier, brother. Uh, Singer had some awesome stories uh, involving oh, yeah. some of the the spirit boxes and ITC. Well, and spoiler. I'll give shit, you a, I'll give you a spoiler alert here in a second uh, since Matthew jumped on. Um, but just to answer your question real quick, three and a half years of therapy have really helped me. I have been back to that location three times about – Three and a half, four weeks ago, I spent a whole week there uh, recording Carolyn's stories from her life to that's cool to write her to help her write her book. Nice, wow, about her life. Now, spoiler alert: if everything works out, there will be a week long investigation expedition at this location in uh, the very end of January of next year. We'll be going down at the end of the January for a whole week to investigate the property again. Matthew will be part of the team this time. And, you know, getting a lot of the old band back together. Cool. And I will be making myself be out in the woods overnight uh, during this investigation. Full circle. At least one night. We will we will stay up, be investigating, not sleeping out there necessarily, but we'll see if I could even do that. But I doubt. I'm not... Baby steps, right? Uh, I just spent a week out there almost a few weeks ago, and I didn't sleep great, but I still slept and nothing crazy. A couple weird things happened, but yeah, nothing crazy. Yeah, you said you were gigging in Florida when we initially were talking. Mm-hmm. We were going to hop on the phone. You said, I'm going on a small little gig That's where tour I was in going. Florida. So you went there. That's where I went. Wow. And the first night. I'll, I'll just tell you this real quick. The first night I'm there... They have these alarms. They have these cameras now all over their property that they've since installed over the years. And each, they have a, like, because they're off the road. It's like a country road, and they're off. You have to go down this long driveway, and you have to go through the woods. And then they have their initial gate has a motion-activated alarm that they hear. Oops, sorry. I'm not talking to you. (laughs) And uh, then they have a second gate that has an alarm that goes off, motion-activated. And then they have a third gate. The front gate, the house, the one that I was like, got to close this gate. Right? So they have the gate in their front yard, which is maybe 20 feet away from the house, second, and then the third. Each one sounds different. You know how a generic cell phone ring is? Or like that kind of goes up in pitch? That alarm is for the front gate. They go to bed at like 9 o'clock, 9.30. I'm still up. It's like 11.30, 12 o'clock. I think I'm watching the World Series. And just trying to like... Please get tired, man. Just get tired. Fall asleep, man. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to sleep while the light's off. I can do this. I've been here twice, two other times already since, right? But each for one night only. So I, there's a lamp right next to me. I turn the TV off. This is after the TV suddenly lost connection. So, like, the cable just went out for no reason. So I'm like, that's weird, but okay. Don't th- it's like not like Sasquatch is out there cutting the cable. <laughs> <laughs> this will scare them. Must I'll get rid of the. Yeah, I'll get rid of the World yeah. Series. <laughs> this is good, right? So I'm not like a total maniac. I'll get rid of the World Series. Oh, shit. And no, you should not bring your AR-15. <laughs> goes boxes, Matthew. When we go for it. Oh my goodness. But uh, no boy. so oh, I dude. literally. This is this is how exactly it happened. And I we'll sleep, I sleep with the door open in the bedroom, so do they, just in case I need them, I can yell or something, right? And they're like, when you're here, we'll sleep with the doors open. So if you need me, it doesn't matter what time it is, you come yell for us so we can hear, you know, leave the door up so we can hear you. And so I TV's off. I, I lean to my left, and it's got one of those little old-school knobs yeah. on the lamp. 
So I go, click. The second I click it, and right outside the door is where the alarm noise, the bells are, where the speakers are, so you can hear the alarms. It's the one that's the front gate. As soon as I go click, instantly it goes. So as soon as I turn the light off in the guest room, which has a window next to the TV, 15 feet away from the front gate, facing it, a large, probably a five foot window that looks directly out to the front gate. As soon as I turn the light off, it's as if something right by the front gate can see that the light is on in this room that he knows where I am. Oh, boy. As soon as that light goes off, it goes, time to move. Nope. (laughs) And it sets the alarm off. I freak out. Come close. (laughs) (laughs) To having a complete meltdown. Yeah. Back into therapy for two years, (laughs) goddammit. Speed dial. I immediately turn the light back on, and I text... I just text Carolyn because I think it's it's probably after midnight at this point. Yeah. And I'm just like, alarm go off, question mark, question mark, question mark. And then uh, and then I was up probably for another three hours, as you can imagine, and then eventually passed out. But um, because I, you know, had driven in that day, you know, we watched some football. It was a Sunday, um, and I was exhausted, and eventually I just fell asleep. Luckily, but it was probably 4.30 in the morning. And Bill gets up around 4.45, 5 in the morning for work. Jesus. So as soon as I can hear him in the kitchen milling around, I'm like, okay, it's safe to fall asleep now. Mm-hmm. But um, whew. but yeah, Damn. that was... Now, granted, that alarm, I come to find out the week that I'm there, is constantly going off. Because if a branch moves in front of it because of yeah. the wind, or if a raccoon or a squirrel, or they don't really have squirrels, but that thing is getting set off but right when constant. the light goes off, though, that right, right when the light goes off, that's what got me. Synchronistically, somebody's speaking, watching. There's something off. About it. And it wasn't especially until if you felt like something was looking at you. Yeah, or... and especially because the window is facing. Yes. The gate. Yeah, yeah. that would and be... it's very very close to it. So yeah, that was. Uh, so that's why I still talk to my therapist today. Damn. Uh, because, well, it started Damn. there, but, but it's uh, he's been great for me. But it's also. I mean, we've been invited on a few trips. Uh, Jesus Pion Jr., Gonzo from Breaking Bad, 30-year Sasquatch researcher out of New Mexico. We've had him on the show. We're working with he him. He goes to, deep. To, yeah, try to – and he's had – he's got so – we'll show you his photos after we wrap. Everybody here has already seen him. You're he's very about public. not being in a tent. Uh, but his th- – these nope. things looking through the top of the tent because where they were camping, they just didn't have the rain fly on. They're up in, you know, high desert New Mexico. And yeah. this tent it's is arid. Jesus is 6'3", big guy. And he s- can stand up inside the tent. Whatever was looking into the tent it's was bent down over it. down into it. And he's got shots. It's wild. It's wild. And I'm going to need you to walk me to my car. Yeah. It's pretty bizarre. I was uh, like, nope, I'm good. But here's the... Here's the but I'm like, dude, do I? Yeah. Re- do we really well, here's the thing you can want to go to therapy for two years right? after... Some I mean, I, squatch well, in northern Arizona, New Mexico starts hunting us down on our I tents. 100% understand why you say that. Yeah. As someone who's been in therapy for three and a half years, but, or for over four years, or three and a half years now. It took me a minute to get in there. But if they wanted, if whatever that was, wanted to hurt me, it could, could have, have hurt me. Could have, yeah. Now, that's an important thing I've had to realize. And... Earlier, when I asked you the question, what's one experience, like what's a Holy Grail experience that would be transformative, oh, even yeah. though you already believe in it? Yeah. Um, would I love to see a Sasquatch? I don't know what it was that made that noise that night. Fair. It could have been a Sasquatch. It could have been something else, because there are reports of various other unknown creatures like dog men. coming out of portals there. <laughs> right. Dogmen are seem to be the culprits for coming in and out of portals. There is there's some reason to believe that that might be the case. Mm-hmm. And I just have never heard a story about the dogman that has made me be like, I'd love yeah, to meet this guy. No, not at all. No. no. There, you hear no. stories of like Sasquatch taking care of children lost in the woods for a couple of days or something right. like that. You yeah. hear these tales. You've never heard I've never heard anything good about Dogman. But yeah. but the point is, even if it was Dogman, 
it could have got me. It didn't. Yeah. So no one has been, no one's got got out yeah. there, like in a physical way. People have been, uh, people other than me have been even worse traumatized out there on this property. But, um, I mean, to the point where someone had to check themselves into a mental hospital for a couple of weeks after Jesus. a visit there. Um, but because of what they experienced, which, ugh, because apparently there's a growl on this property. There's a creature that will make a growl out there. And it's been heard a few times. It's been heard by Carolyn uh, multiple times. It's been heard by this person. Um, uh, And there's, you know, I've heard creatures being described uh, out there from people who will never return to that property. I've I've heard them described as uh, something along the lines of, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you need to move immediately. Something unholy is here. Mm. Like, wow. you cannot live right. here. Right. There is a monster Jeez. on your property. Oh. Right. Wow. So, like, people have described it like that. And we're talking <clears throat> about, like, people who are professors or who have, you know, hyper interested and want to research this stuff and have shown up at that property and they're like, get the hell out of here. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, no one has been physically harmed. I've been back three times now for a total of about eight days. Uh, nothing crazy really has really happened. When we go back in January with Matthew, I'm sure we, I, I 100%, I know we're going to get things because that's just what happens there. Um, I will be out in the woods and I will do my damnedest to be clinging tightly to Matthew and my buddy, <laughs> my buddy Dan Butler, who's, you know, he's this big, you know, this former game warden guy. He's like, yeah. You know, if you look up machismo in the dictionary, <laughs> it's this guy. And I'm just going to be, like, attached by Velcro to his leg, right? Uh, so. I love it. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, so it's, like, you got to be careful what you ask for sometimes. Right. Because you just might get it. Good point. A hundred percent. I'm I'm always aware of that. And, you know, some of the strange things I've experienced, Serpent Mound's kind of the hot spot here in Ohio that keeps drawing us back, whether it's, you know, in, in working with, you know, so the elders with the Serpent Mound Star Knowledge groups and Friends of the Serpent Mound. Some I'd of love these to groups. go there with you guys. Oh, man, it's it would be the rad. Incredible place. It would be rad. Yeah. Introduce you to Tom and Terry. Who Mike knows the... everybody down there and has <clears> really, <throat> really oh. understood that kind of landscape and, and just... Yeah. The the amount of inroads he's built. It's and the kind Serpent of Mountain. To. Yeah, it's the wild. impact crater area as a whole is a supercharged a paranormal hotspot. Well, he said earlier um, wanting to live on like a ley line, a ley line, or this or that. Or well, line. there's like, an interesting go to triangle Serpent that forms between uh, the Serpent Mounds, Post Town, and um, the other mounds. Uh, Newark. Uh, it might be the Newark Mounds. I, it's been a minute since I've been like mad science. And where's Post Town again? Post Town's Middletown, Ohio. Middletown, okay. So it's Did, south. Hold on. Slightly Did James southwest Willis of Dayton. Talk to us about that place. He might have. Do you know James Weird Willis? I don't know. He Weird wrote Willis. Weird Ohio, Weird America. Oh, okay. He's Back an author, day, yeah. paranormal researcher. Yeah. Lives in Worthington, Ohio. We've had him on the show, but I could have swore he talked to us about this. He about might've. this spot. Um, but there's. It's an interesting. There's an interesting. Or at least an interesting triangle that shows up, and um, and then like in accord with that, you also seemingly. And, and I'm speaking out of school here because I, I can't remember exactly, but sure. we're talking about like bodies of water, like whether it's rivers, and oh also yeah, Springs. train tracks, also kind of like encapsulate this triangle. Yeah. Also, um, anyway, it's it's really fascinating stuff. I might have to uh, take the. Uh, I might have to relieve the. Uh, yeah, Red yeah, Bowl. you're good. Yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. You're good. Oh, I can 100%. just get up and go. Oh, yeah, it. absolutely. Yeah, okay. dude. Yeah, I mean, and if you got to go, we can wrap this baby up. Maybe, or, yeah, maybe we put a bow on it and I then do I do that. It. Let's do totally. that. Because I guess it's almost 11. I should probably get. Yeah, for sure, for sure. 
Um, guys, this has been absolutely phenomenal. I know you guys are rocking in the chat. Um, thank you to everybody that came out. Uh, we had, hey, Tom B. Stone, Tombstone. Um, guys, make sure, go follow Necro Mechanimal on Instagram. I know we the image today was phenomenal. Uh, and even Ryan, check out tech, check out Necro. He, he does artwork for tons of different podcasts. Oh, yeah, I saw the uh, the post. I loved it. The one He's from today. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to say, though, that... Um, I'll be going on tour with a couple of buddies of mine. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's called the Goofball Run. Uh, comedian Dave Stone, who used to have the Boogie Monster podcast yeah. with Kyle Conane. Uh My buddy Jeff Tate, he opens for Tom Segura and all the biggest arenas cool. around the world. Wow. Uh, my buddy Gilbert Lowend, uh, very funny. Uh, the four of us are doing the Goofball Run starting December 5th in New Orleans is the first date. And then we, we travel west and north from there, end up in Fort Collins on the 17th. Uh, great, of December. Great. So the goofballrun.com has got all the links and tickets. And Very cool. We're doing New Orleans, Bryan, Texas, Lafayette. We're doing Taos, New Mexico, Cheyenne, um, Fort Collins. We're doing Trinidad, Colorado, which is, you know, which is the site of one of, just outside of Trinidad is one of the most famous cattle mutilation ranches. Oh, wow. Where I've gotten to visit, actually. The, the buddy of mine, Greg Feynman, is, a, is investigating the property. But, um, yeah, so it's... Uh, yeah, and RyanSingerComedy.com's got all my dates. Yep. In Dayton, Ohio, the 22nd, 23rd of December. Very cool. At, at Wiley's. And but, you're uh, still doing The Attic here January 27th? January 27th, I'll be in Columbus at The Attic. Fantastic. Nice. We'll be at that show. We, yeah. We won't want to miss that. Um, and then, guys, also, all of Ryan's links are in the description. Go check out him. Go support. Um, dude. It's been amazing. This was fun. It was so awesome. awesome. I mean, I feel like awesome. I talk too much. No, but... no, 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 God, no, no, <laughs> no, no. That, that's part of the plot. We're getting yeah, better yeah. at not talking all the time. We're trying to keep ourselves from. <laughs> that's yeah. what I tell people. Like when people come on my show, they'll be like, you know, I, I don't know. I can kind of talk a lot. I'm like, that's exactly what this is made for. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, no one's epic as Burt Kreischer on his own podcast. <laughs> oh, my God. I remember. Someone reminded me. I, you know, you forget things. You reminded yeah, me. Yes, so that's I, how I found out about That's you, right, because of the Burt cast from what, yep. was, what, six And you were talking about least? paranormal stuff, and, he, and Burt's mind was just blown. I, he doesn't get... Uh, you know, he doesn't hear about that kind of stuff a lot. But so. this is why. This is our cool. end of the pool. Yeah. This is where we swim all the time. He's got That's a thing with Dice, though, and because he was supposed to. Dice? I never followed. Not Dice, Dice Man. Oh. But uh, there was something. God, I have to. I, you know, he's way too busy now. But because he was supposed to come on my podcast after that. Because he's got this thing where he rolls dice. And it's like this really crazy thing. Like, really? It's like predictive of. like Whoa. He can. There's something about. Bert and Bert's a, Bert's a strange guy. I mean, he's got a lot of hidden talents. Yeah, I it mean, it seems that dude is that dude cannot be contained. <laughs> he's a sh- force of nature. Yeah, 100%. we were watching clips the other day, just cracking up. Oh yeah, crying. I, I showed tears. Bub his uh, his story about Tracy Morgan and oh my god, some of those old like that's kind of what really blew Bert up when he was still doing yeah. Travel Channel. We take small breaks throughout the day if we need just a comedy <laughs> break. We'll put on some old school stuff. Oh my and pull god, pull some YouTube clips. Yeah, so no, great. he's great. Just laugh our asses off. But guys, go check out Ryan Singer. Go check out me and Paranormal. You go check out all of his stuff, dude. We appreciate the hell out of you, Thank dude. Thanks you for having me. So this, I love love the studio. I got to come back. Anytime. Oh, anytime. anytime. I'll anytime. be here in the morning when you wake up. <laughs> Dude, beanbag chair. We got the futon, whatever you need. Uh, and also, I, I will 100% hit you up about going down to Serpent Mound. There's several events yes. down there. There's stuff going on all the time that we bring people. We've met a lot of our listeners at some events uh, here this summer. Um, there's two different groups down there that have different events. And so within that, um, you know, meeting Jeffrey Wilson and Tom and Terry and, and just their community of just strength strange human beings with be awesome. amazing stories. There's a lot. There's great. a lot there. Yeah. Um, There's a lot there. Well, let's put this baby to bed. You guys can find us at The Strange Road on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Uh, we want to give a, a special shout out to Papa Stoner, Stoner's dad. Much love to him today. He just had surgery. Keep rocking. So all the prayers. Keep rocking. The crystal energy, the love, the whatever you guys can throw out there in the universe for Stoner's dad, Papa Stoner. Send it on with over. with you, brother. Um, and thank you to, you know, obviously Necromechanimal doing all 
all the dope art for us. Uh, shout out to Matthew Jackson, the Paraholics was in here, Cryptids of the Corn, Burt Moran, local legends, Sess in the City, uh, Born Not to Run, God, who else am I forgetting? Um, Everybody and anybody. Thank was in you there. guys so much. We are signing out. Love, peace, and chicken grease. Later. Thank you guys Thank so much. You. This was fun. Dude. <laughs> that was Hell a good yeah. one.